You have now arrived at Stadium and Gale. The kick, it's been blocked again! You have now arrived at Stadium and Gale. Boys and girls, ladies and gents, welcome to another episode of Stadium and Gale. It's your favorite Uncle Silk. It's Dan. Hey, and Delatory. Same corner, same time, and all kinds of weathers, fellas. How y'all feeling? Speaking of weather, I'll be honest with you, the weather in Tampa today was fantastic. Uh, the weather machine man has been in his bag lately. It's nice down here in South Florida as well. Now, when we're talking about good things from this weekend. You know, the weather was great. Um, it was good to hang out with some friends. I mean, it, that, that those are my as – as a Florida Gators fan and as a Miami Dolphins fan, that's all I've got left. That's uh, a bad week for you, Dan. It's a bad, bad week. weekend for you. I'm sorry my Jags had to do what they had to do, Dan. This is strictly business, man. Don't take it personal. Yeah, I get it. I get it. It's, it's, very, it's, it's very Dolphins uh, to be bad in a year where there's no, like, franchise-changing quarterback. It's yeah, very yeah, well, on brand. Dan, Dan thought they, he had Tua in, like, the next, like, uh, Hawaiian Dan Marino, but it didn't work out for him. That's right. No, no. Uh, I was never big on Tua. I wasn't big on Justin Herbert, though. So, like, revisionist history, I didn't think uh, I didn't think the Dolphins wanted, wanted either of them. Nobody ever admits when they, like – was big on somebody that like flake. Yeah, nobody was I, ever like, "Hey, I was a huge Ryan Leaf fan." Just didn't work out for him, you know. <laughs> Everybody's I mean, they've always pulled, <laughs> they've pulled the receipts on that one for people that, that liked right, him right. over Peyton. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I wasn't big on the small quarterback who had a broken hip, um, and I wasn't big on Herbert who had played what like twelve games, twelve right. games as a starter. All right, we got to talk about our own business here. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, I was in I was in uh, New Orleans with yeah, with Zach nice. with Zach Albert Um Took him down to Bourbon Street. I was trying to have a nice, respectable night. Um, that was not Zach's plan. I think that's going to be his only road trip of the year. So uh, had a couple of drinks, had some steak for dinner. Took him to I'll Pat O's. He, he had never had a hurricane. Oh man, okay. Um, a hurricane and, like and a drink. The drink, yeah. Very did you, sit by the, did you sit by the fire? That's no, sat right by the fire. The, the fountain fire. Chili's sat right by the fire. Some uh, a dad and his son, both wearing LSU, shouting "Go Tigers!" We sat there and we were talking to them. They had just gotten kicked out of a strip club. Oh wow! Okay. Um, as nice. they were talking to us, uh, and uh, yeah, the night uh, quickly uh, going quickly to a strip went, club with your father is, is is insane to me. That's not something. Shout out, shout out, Dad. I don't think uh, Chuck and I will ever be participating uh, oh, no, in, no, no. at a strip club together ever. Frank and I'm I have never been to a strip club together. I can't can't remember can't remember what the guys' names were, uh, Dad or Son. But yeah, they were very proud that they gotten kicked out of the strip club. So I wonder what uh, the, our night hmm. our night ended around two thirty. Um, I left Zach somewhere, got in my Uber, got home, got out of New Orleans alive. Very good. Very good. That had to Shot. be the highlight of your weekend right there, right? Hang out with Zach Saturday night was the highlight of my weekend. Yeah. Oh, y'all went on Saturday night after L. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You gotta enjoy you. I understand. Listen, I understand. Bourbon, Bourbon Street, those people Bourbon Street, every every other year when when Dan will attest to this, when mm-hmm. Florida goes to LSU, all the fraternities mm-hmm. do a bus trip and they jump into a bus and that bus takes them from Gainesville straight to New Orleans. They, there's an available bus that will take them from New Orleans to Baton Rouge for the game. Right. None of them went. I'm walking around, and I'm telling you, it was a fraternity sorority party on Bourbon Street. Stop, talk to a bunch of them. They're like, yeah, I didn't go to the game. We watched it here. And I'm like, it looks like you've been here for a while. Yeah, no, it does. 
look like you've spent your entire yeah, day. Yeah, no, normally train. what they'll normally what they'll do is they'll take a bunch of buses, you know, four, five, six buses, and then they'll maybe send one bus up to Baton Rouge and the rest will just hang out there in uh in New Orleans. That's a hell of a time. That's a hell of a trip. New Orleans is uh is one of my favorite places to go, not just because of Bourbon Street, but uh, as a college kid, man, what a what a place! It uh wild, wild. Uh, I think there were like four or five different fraternities uh, mm -hmm. that we recognized that were there. Um, just crazy to think that at some point I'll have kids and I'll be paying for their college education and they'll be doing the things that I watched happen on Bourbon mm -hmm. Street. Mm -hmm. That's not in the curriculum. <laughs> oh man well so how was your weekend before we get into the show outside of the obvious oh i saw the obvious man i can't complain man you know weather was beautiful like you said dan didn't do a whole lot just just family uh it was my anniversary this weekend um, congrats so the Happy anniversary that, six years rolling um, was your uh was your anniversary yesterday the 17th correct 10 17 oh. shout out to gucci man yeah, yeah, and shout out to my mom. That was her birthday, uh, or is her nice. birthday. Uh, so it's a, a splendid day. Yeah, was a, that was a, that was. A, uh, I got married on the day that Treyon Harris took over for Will Greer. Um, hmm. Day at LSU. Hmm. Rough day. No, it's not a beautiful day because I lost <laughs> that life. Shout out to my man Chris from the Zen Zen Zencastic podcast. He was at my wedding that day, so he he was giving me like updates when things were good, and I knew when he stopped giving me updates that things were bad. So I didn't check to that next morning, man. So the wedding was was beautiful. Shout out to my beautiful wife Shakira. Uh, just had a great time yesterday, just hanging out with her, having some drinks, being some teenagers with no kids, man. Fun times. Shakira's great, man. So congratulations. Uh, so let's get into uh, the Brunt ad read uh, to start our show, and we'll we'll get through this LSU game together as a family. Time for the great folks at Brunt Insurance and Financial Services from the Panhandle to, from the Panhandle to the Keys. My man Greg got you. Car, motorcycle, boat, life insurance, homeowners insurance, business insurance. My man Greg got you. Nine five four five eight nine two two zero four or visit bruninsurance.com for all your insurance needs, big coverage. Greg, what do you do? All right. So um, the unfortunate part of the show is we do have to talk about the, the Florida LSU game. The Gators do go down uh, in a game where LSU scores the most points in series history for them uh, with 49 uh, beating the Gators 49 to 42. Uh, what we didn't know until after the game uh, was that Ed Orgeron had already uh, signed his paperwork to separate from Louisiana State. Uh, so Florida lost to a uh, to a fired coach and a team that was missing six defensive starters, uh, missing a number of other playmakers for themselves as well. Uh, the Gators go down early, 21 to six. Uh, Emory Jones makes a unbelievable, spectacular play at the end of the second half or the end of the second quarter. Pardon me to Justin Shorter. Uh, to bring the game to 21 to three or 13. Uh, the Gators end up tying at 35, 35, but then ultimately end up losing a game that they should not have lost for the second game in a row to a depleted team uh, and a team that uh, for all intents and purposes uh, was not a fan and did not believe in the coach anymore and a coaching staff that struggled to work with Ed Orgeron. Uh, and the Gators find themselves in a position after an LSU game, truly wondering what the future holds, and have we seen the pinnacle of Dan Mullen's coaching career at the University of Florida? So before we get into kind of the prevailing discussion over the last 48 hours, um, Nick, you were obviously there. want to talk to you a little bit about the game. Um, outside of the obvious score, uh, let's talk about the good things that we saw from, from your opinion. Um, I, I thought it was a, a good environment, you know, I think they said 96,000 um, is the announced attendance. Um, I, I thought it was a little bit light of that, but considering you had just had 15 penalties the last time you were on the road, it was 60,000 um, to have no penalties on Saturday. That's a good sign. I thought Anthony Richardson um, finished 10 of 19, three touchdown passes, uh, 37 rushes, another touchdown, so four total touchdowns. I thought that that's a good sign. Um, and then I start to struggle for what was good after that. I think, 
think those are the goods that I got from the game. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I'm just going to regurgitate, regurgitate a lot of what, what Nick said. Um, and a lot of Anthony Richardson, um, the run game. I'm trying to make one. He was getting busy. He dropped one, but picked it back up. Um, I thought the run game, Anthony Richardson looked good. Uh, shout out to Copeland, man. Um, mm-hmm. He didn't get targeted a lot, but he made the most of what he got. Um, Gamble had a really good game. Um, mm-hmm. He started really picking up once Anthony Richardson, Richardson got in. Started, I seen some good chemistry uh, between my second second quarterback at the time and then and my pass catchers. It just seemed like guys had more chemistry and he was throwing guys up a little bit. So that's the best, the, the good stuff that I saw from Saturday. Yeah, um, not a whole lot of defense. Um, mm-hmm. No, <laughs> just no. not n- nothing worth 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 really mentioning uh, defensively. Yeah, uh, thought it was uh, Justin Shorter's best game of the season. He goes for 113 yards. Um, I thought that they had a okay game plan at, at times. There were some mistakes early on. Uh, was some interceptions. Um, you know, the first Anthony Rich. Richardson, um, but you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you guys kind of hit the the names. Uh, the play from Trent Whittemore to Emory Jones was was exciting. Certainly, the Justin Shorter uh, touchdown at the end of the second quarter uh, was exciting. But there, there's very few things defensively um, we could obviously talk about. But when you score 42 points in a game, you should win uh, that game. Um, I thought on the defensive side of the ball. There's a couple players that played okay. Um, I thought that Antonio Valentino played pretty well. Uh, I thought Jadarius Perkins played okay. Uh, But obviously, um, LSU ran that same counter play over and over and over again uh, and gashed the Gators for the most yards by a single running back in school. Um, The Gators have played uh, some unbelievable and some of the most talented running backs ever to uh, play the game of football, and none of them were able to get as many yards as LSU uh, was able to get uh, with their, pardon me, with their running back, uh, David. So uh, he ends up with 287 yards, three touchdowns. So uh, long story short, Gators lose this one. Uh, it was a bad loss. Um, where do you guys think this, you know, before we get into the discussion, where, where do you think the Gators go from here football-wise um, moving forward? Um, you're gonna find out a lot what uh, what the team is made of, what what these what these players are made of. Um, you're not playing for anything. Uh, you're four and three, probably gonna be four and four in two weeks. Um, so you know, bowl eligibility is gonna have to come mid to late November. Um, you're playing for a bowl that you know a lot of people might not want to be in. So w- w- how do you show up every day? How do you show up to practice? How do you show up to lifts? How do you show up on Saturday? Because you're not playing mm-hmm. for all the goals and everything you worked for. You probably broke huddles in, in, in you know, 6 a.m. workouts to go lift with, you know, win the SEC, win the East. And mm-hmm. um, you're, you're doing all these things, saying all these things. That's gone. So what are you showing up for? What are you going to still bust your ass for at practice? Or do you say mm-hmm. it's not worth it? And, and do we see a team roll over? That, that's what we're going to learn about Florida um, in these coming weeks. What are they made of? Yeah, I definitely think the morale of this team, the overall team morale is about to be tested. Um mm-hmm. A lot of questionable stuff going on. I mean, whether it's Diabate with, with some quotes he had in the presser um, about, like, um, when asked certain questions, I'm starting to question maybe, you know what I'm saying, do we have the locker room? Uh, when you have a, a culture of seemingly as the, the backups are, are, like, talent more talented than starters, like, you start to, like, and you start to lose games, um, you can potentially lose that locker room if guys not believing in uh, the competition process. So um, I just want to see just the best players play. Uh, we, we've seen guys that, that the fans have, have questioned, media have questioned about um, should certain guys be starting or should other guys be given opportunities. Um, and that's just showed itself this fall. Like some of that stuff is true. Um, a lot of it's true. So I just want to see the best players play, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, win, lose, or draw. I think it's, it, it's no, it's, you're not doing the kid that's starting, that don't, that don't supposed to be starting. You're not doing him any. Mm-hmm. Justice, like you're not doing him any service, um, or the kid that's in behind him. That's not fair to him. Um, mm-hmm. You sell on the recruiting trail that the best players are gonna play. Him, the teammate, his teammates, the fans deserve to see the best absolute player. If Emory Jones isn't the best player right now, um, 
like somebody has to say it, but he just if he ain't the guy, then he ain't the guy. Um, that ain't fair to Emery to, to try him out in front of this rabbit fan base. Um, if he's just not putting up or, or producing um, like he should. Uh, the other guy came in and made some plays. So I just want to see the best players play, bro. Uh, I yeah. feel a little robbed. I don't. I, I think like I think AR has been shelled, like criminally shelled. You know what I'm saying? Like we see what that kid could do. There's no issues with the playbook or anything like that. For that kid not been getting at least forty percent of the snaps this fall, like we got robbed. Uh, his teammates mm -hmm. got robbed as well. Yeah, uh, Lorenzo Lingard even tweeted about it uh, to somebody in response. Uh, there was a, a tweet thread and, and somebody said uh, about Lorenzo Lingard specifically that he responded to. I know it's not that difficult for him to pick up blitz passages uh, and learn how to block to which Lorenzo Lingard responded to this individual by saying it's a seniority deal. I'm well prepared. It's a true system of waiting your turn. It sucks, but it's the process. I won't be denied. Trust me. This is something that Shout out to Paul Sammons, who had time uh, Sunday night to pull all the receipts from 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015 from Mississippi State, where there was a lot of the same concerns. Now, I, I will say that just because we think from the, the sideline that, that somebody might be the best player, they may not be, and there may be other things here. But to hear active players saying that it's strictly a seniority deal, and I'm not saying that the running back room is missing Lorenzo Lingard or they're not producing the way that they should but if that's the prevailing thought throughout everything that's done in a seniority issue you now have to wonder if that now affects recruiting and a kid's desire for an elite kid to come to Florida if he knows that he's going to have to wait his turn um, there there's a lot of issues with that beyond just being loyal right and one of the things that Dan Mullen has always been is loyal and we're almost seeing it to a fault, both to his coaching it's staff, a, a to personnel like decisions, and players. It's a little weird when you say loyal with the players things, though, because they're all his players. Mm -hmm. But that's why I don't, I don't get it. You know, um, yep. and in today's football, you can't shelf guys because now it's free agency. Like if I feel like I can play somewhere else, and you holding me back, I can leave next year. Like I'm out of here. I can jump in the portal, and I'm gone. Um, some guys the portal don't work out for, but if you if you have uh, a kid like uh, Lingard or, or or even Anthony Richardson, you are gonna have some takers. So I think you got to learn to play with these kids now. Like the five stars don't want to come sit on the bench. All right, the kids that know they can play, and then their teammates know they can play too because they have practice, so they see the yep. shit. Well, like, and, and they and know he's jumping over people at practice. Like like they're like, yo, this kid's amazing, and we got our best offensive player sitting on the bench. It, it, I have one quick thought, Nick, before you jump in. I wonder where that mentality came from, because I remember Dan Mullen, you know, when he worked under Urban Meyer, and maybe he just didn't have a choice, and this is what Urban Meyer told him to no, do. No, those are Urban calls for him. You know, but like Percy Harvin played as a freshman. Jared Faison played as a freshman. Jeff Demps, Chris Rainey, a lot of these guys that came in that were these all-purpose players that you were like, or pardon me, all-American players that you wanted to play, immediately played. And I wonder if this goes back to Mississippi State and Dan Mullen truly believe in like the development of a player because he wasn't getting your your highly ranked four star and five star guys he's getting your you know your three star maybe low four, four star guys that says hey if you're in the program long enough i feel like it can develop you into a really good player but you need that time well the difference between mississippi state and florida is very 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 obvious right now and if you want to recruit those top flight kids you've got to give them an opportunity to play even if they don't know 100 percent of the playbook because they're difference makers and if you can't get difference makers Makers on the field, then you've got massive issues. And I think we're seeing that Anthony Richardson to Marcus Bowman, you know, there's it's happening all over. Fam, this isn't Pop Warner. <laughs> well, we've yeah, seen right. weird stuff like even the, the safety rotation nonsense we saw before. Like mm -hmm. a lot of this is nonsense, bro. This is SEC big boy football, bro. Nothing about that. The way he's moving is the Gator standard. The Gator standard is not to not play the best players. That's, that's just, like, I don't understand that energy. That entire thing is crazy to me. You can't really go take take a team out and compete for championships with that type of energy and that running that type of outfit. Mm -hmm. um, at the risk of sounding like, you know, the, uh, the grumpy, disgruntled, you know, writer, um, I would love to have practices back open. Um, when Mike White, and I know that's a, a fan favorite name to bring up, when Mike White was first brought in, 
he had everyone in the media over and he showed us his offense and he showed us his defense and, and how they run practice and showed us all these things, all these things in his mind. You're going to see, you gonna see his, Anthony Richardson jump over people, Nick, and write about it. Well, so what, what Mike White did is, hey, I, I don't want you to publish this. This is all off the record stuff. Um, he's like, but I want you to show, um, I want you to show, or to know what we're doing because you have to intelligently write about us and you have to intelligently talk about our program and this is what we're doing. So coaches everywhere have closed practice. They don't want things out there. And I get it. Like Vernon Hargreaves got hurt at a practice one time that we were out there and someone takes a picture of him getting carted off and it, it hits the timeline before. I get that. But there's ways you can help yourself by letting the media know, or let, let them into practice. Hey, and I can tell you, Anthony Richardson doesn't look that good in practice. He hasn't looked like that. So what you're seeing in the fourth quarter against FAU and USF isn't what I saw all summer, all fall, all spring. Now, it could be. It could be. You might, he might just want to be playing the guy that's been here four years instead of the guy that's been here for a year and a half. And, and he might not want to, uh, um, you know, might not want people to know that. But I'm saying if, if you're looking for – I think Mike White's gotten some favorable cover from us just because of how open and honest – Transparency. He's been. With the media, transparent. There's sure. football, like I've said before, you know, you got Kim Jong Kim Jong Mullen up there. Everything is closed off. They view us as the enemy. If you're not in that building, it's us versus you. And, and then when stuff happens like this, I can't tell you, hey, listen, Tyron Hopper wasn't ready. Like he got better this this fall, this summer, this spring. He just wasn't ready because I saw it in practice. I couldn't tell you that. I just see it mm -hmm. on Saturday, and, and like a fan, I'm like, yeah, no, he looks great. And then the coach tells you after the game. Yeah, well, he's still developing. He's still getting better. It's like, well, I just have to take your word for it. And I think now at year four, fans are tired of taking Dan's word for stuff. Bro, it was wild that the one comment that he had about quarterbacks was the best play of the game was Emory Jones' third and 16 play, right? It's like, how great did Anthony Richardson play to keep you in the game? It's like, well, yeah, but what about that third and 16? It's like, it's just we, we get it. Like, that, like that's awesome. For you. Like, right. The, the, but, like, the psychology game he's trying to play, bro, you can't play him. You're not Urban Meyer. Like it's not working. Like it's not working for the kids. Kid, like, like I we've seen. Like you feel the energy of all that stuff, man. I'm glad both guys like each other and they're cheering for each other. But obviously, one has a higher ceiling. Obviously, the team flows and goes better with, 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 with another guy. When Dan's getting in front of that podium, playing those games of uh, I'm gonna talk bad about uh, 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 Anthony Richardson to boost Emory's morale. Like that's all weird to me, fam. The all our players, you know, encourage both of them, say positive things about both, move on, and just play the best guy. Like the whole world's watching this. Like this, like national guys are saying things about Anthony Richardson and Emory Jones at this point. Oh, um, and it started off at the beginning of the season when he blew Koblick off, right? Cube Koblick mm -hmm. asked him mm -hmm. at like leaving the game. He scuffed at him like, "What? What quarterback battle now? Here we are." <laughs> like Cole, like Cole, don't watch football every Saturday and play this game himself in the SEC. Mm -hmm. He got an eye as well. He's watching the same football we watching, Dan. Yeah. What do you mean, um, <laughs> Michael Lombardi? Let me read that. Yeah, right there. Michael Nick Lombardi, who was a a former uh, NFL general manager, was a general ma general manager for Bill Belichick. I think that was in Cleveland. Um, they're on his podcast. They're talking about the NFL and they're talking about they don't really have a number one quarterback this year. For the draft, there's no really one guy you point to and you, and you say, "Hey, that that guy's going to be a franchise changer." He stopped himself. He goes in three years. Richardson, the kid from Florida, he's probably the first pick in the draft from when I saw TV scouting on Saturday. I mean, that kid was sensational. I don't understand Dan Mullen. I know we're not talking college football here on this show, but I don't know what Dan Mullen's watching at practice. Neither do I, Mike. Uh, how is that? How is that guy not the starter every single he play? Jumped over people like. <laughs> He he he, he's he said, balls on a rope. Like I don't he, care he, what's going he, on the press in games. He's <laughs> dropping absolute dimes and jumping over people, bro. It's Willie Beeman. You know what I'm saying? Just, he, like, spent, he just spent all practice. <laughs> it's Willie he Beeman. Spent all practice like Nick Saban just dropping D's nuts jokes. It doesn't matter. He starts on Saturday. <laughs> That's right. right. No doubt. Um, so Lombardi goes on. His son played at Louisville when Lamar Jackson was there. And he says, you know, I saw Lamar in practice, and it's almost like, you know, a young thoroughbred, like a horse. Uh, they don't have their legs underneath him yet, and you, and you just got to wait until they figure it out. Obviously, the Music City Bowl, uh, Lamar figured it out against Texas A&M. He goes, 
all came together the next year. He wins the Heisman. Richardson looks way ahead of Lamar. Way ahead of him. I don't know how you make that judge. I guess that must be the first games. I wouldn't be able to say that because he played about 36 snaps in five, in five, six games before that. Hmm. But that's, an, that's a former NFL GM. Now, you had a uh, – your quote your, your quote caused a little stir this weekend um, that you tweeted up <laughs> and typed out. Boy, that's got um, like 750,000 impressions on it now. They ratioed you? Did you get ratioed? No? I mean, I, I'm getting ratioed a lot in press conferences. So it's not me. <laughs> it's not you. It's I, feel not like, you. I feel like <laughs> I'm not getting ratioed. Yeah. I'm just yeah. – yeah. it, It's like when it's like – It's a part of like, friendly fire. It, it's yeah, like yeah, yeah. someone walking out and punching the mailman in the face because he brought your electric bill. It's like, hey, right. man, I'm just – I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't run. Yeah, I didn't leave right. all the lights on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't leave all the lights on. I'm just telling you what happened. Um, but Mark Long basically asked Anthony, hey, some fans are worried that you're going to transfer because you're not playing enough. Can you walk them off the ledge? Can you reassure them? And Anthony did not. <laughs> he, he, he did not. I, I, it was kind of like a weird time for the question. He definitely seemed caught off guard by it. Um, let me pull, have him pull it up right now. He said, that's not my time. Or opinion to speak on. Oh, no, that was plays. <laughs> he said a couple of things. He goes, I can't really speak on that. Time is the only thing that I can tell. But right now I'm a Gator. So that's the only thing that matters. And I was kind of just sitting there like, what? what do you? I mean, the, elephant, just- the real elephant in the room is if Emory come back, right? Yeah, I was, I was like, maybe I was like, Mark, maybe you're confused. This isn't Emory. This is Anthony. I think I think we're talking about the wrong transferring quarterback. Mark, 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 Mark asking the real questions. You'll never get a shout out to Mark on from from this part of the podcast. <laughs> two thirds, two thirds of Stadium Gale. Shouts out Mark Long. Uh, just that's a great question. Um, got a got a beautiful um, quote. I like the quote. Good job. Yeah, he did. He did walk, walk that bat. He wants to be a Gator, and that you know he's excited for the future and everything back. else. But uh, but, but that's, 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 that's definitely that's like definitely not that the. Uh, it's definitely not the other uh, response that Gator Nation was expecting uh, after that game. Uh, but uh, I tried to, there was a, another, um, oh, here, we can talk about what Mahmoud Diabate said too uh, if we're talking about press conference. Bro, so, quotes. first off, real quick, sidebar yeah. Mahmoud, Mahmoud Diabate, Silks had a chance to talk to him. This is a smart dude. Yeah, very like, intelligent guy. Yeah. Like, like, could probably apply for and be a finalist for like the Rhodes Scholarship. Like, oh, no doubt, real, really intelligent kid. Smart, my mood in the most quiet, respectful, assassin like way said to hell with Todd Grantham in his press conference. I mm-hmm. love it. Respectfully, quietly, and categorically said to hell with this guy. Asked about the level of the defensive scheme. He said, I'm confident in my teammates and my teammates' ability to play hard, to be where they're supposed to be. I'm confident in my teammates. Right. The question I know we fire people later. I know we fire people later. The question was about Todd and the scheme. <laughs> I know we fire people later, but there, there's like – you had the Sean Davis tweet about talking about uh, the, like bad scheme stuff. Yeah, about uh, He wasn't the yeah. only one. We watched how, how terrible – how like Mark Marco Wilson came here, a good DB, uh, played well early as a freshman, was really good. Uh, good these guys in Arizona right now. Mm-hmm. I'm the I'm going to finish this day. Uh, these guys show up and he forgets how to play DB. Gets drafted. Um, obviously, some NFL is that seen some potential there. It was like, oh, them bozos probably just can't coach. Uh, and now Marco's doing well in the NFL as a DB. I think we're going to see something similar with Trey Dean. I think Trey Dean's going to do very well in the NFL as well. He looks crazy sometimes here, but I think we got we're putting kids in bad positions and they're not being coached up right on that side of the ball. But we're firing mm-hmm. people later. Nick, Matt, did you yeah, finish? But, did you finish the quote or no? Uh, that finished one quote. So yeah, I don't asked, think he said it. You said yeah, it this asked, is the second quote. He was, he was asked to clarify, like, okay, well, I asked you about <laughs> your, your confidence in in the scheme that your coach made, and you said you're confident in your teammates. So uh, you said that you guys made adjustments. Uh, he said we made the adjustments we were given to make. Uh, mm-hmm. Then they said, well, mm-hmm. were there not many adjustments, or did it seem like they were just hitting you with the same play over and over? He goes, yeah. It seemed like they were hitting us with a similar scheme, kind of counter run. We had whoever we had in the box, so we had to play it how we played it. Not great. <laughs> Was there anything else you could have done differently? <laughs> Honestly, I don't know. That's not my decision to make. I don't look into those things. I'm like a soldier. When the general tells me where to shoot, I shoot. Oh, I don't really man, ask too many so questions. Well, so That's well. y'all's job. <laughs> and we asked Dan, and Dan said they'll evaluate. He filibustered his post-game presser. 
he filibustered it with uh we got to look and, he, at the tape. and he's got, he's did, got a couple did, more did days give, to, uh, to set his uh to set his message too before that teleconference did, Bro, did they uh, tell him about to clear his up too did he get a, did he get a cute message to put out uh, no, no, he ain't. No, he ain't listen, <laughs> he, he's also like, with, with as like, with as devout of like a Muslim he is, and how strong he is in his faith. Like he's not gonna sit there and lie to us. Like someone, it's not necessarily that say players are lying, but they'll just like tow whatever the company line is that week and not answer a question or protect somebody. He's not gonna do that, but he's not. He's not gonna lie to you. But he just like surgically knew exactly what to say to get what he wanted to get across without coming across you know like like an angry emotional football player after a bad loss bro we lost a depleted lsu team it's just embarrassing yeah like straight no, up it's a bad lsu like, team. Like, like that's a terrible team for a coach that just got fired this morning the players didn't want to play he, no it. no all the he players got, he, were injured bro he got fired before the game they were like yeah, hey listen and, we're gonna give you he, all 17 million dollars to stop doing this go do literally anything else in the entire world that isn't LSU football and we'll Ed Orgeron was bringing his girlfriend's children to play football in practice. And like that's us. how bad LSU was. And hey, they beat us. Hey, he yeah. had bimbos at practice, just vibing. <laughs> you you got to do what you got to do sometimes. As a as a he didn't know LSU official, he's, he's back in the pregnant wives. Like Ed O is a wild man, bro. He was just <laughs> running around town with new, uh, like a million, uh, a hillbilly with a million bucks, yeah. bro. He he knew that he's the king. He, he knew he was the king. Seventeen million around. bucks. He's a yeah. hillbilly. With Seventeen million. Just he's calling gonna, that pregnant woman and stuff. Tro- like, this guy's wild. He's probably he probably packed in their their twenty nineteen national championship trophy. Go, this mine too. Uh, amongst that all of that, and he leaves. Uh, this guy that brings bimbos to practice uh, talked like Cookie Monster and was fired. <laughs> Bi coach again. Without trying again, two years in a row. That's crazy. Two games that you're supposed to win handedly. Like this, not good football teams. This is embarrassing. Yeah. University of Florida teams. not embarrassed. Like then I don't know. Like what? How else? I could care more. If, if University of Florida is not embarrassed by the Kentucky, the way we look, Kentucky, the, the L's we've been taking are egregious. Mm-hmm. His his wow. resume is egregious right now. Like that shit is not the standard, fam. Yeah, four like, and, and the fans against. are starting to care less, man. Like we don't always support these players, mm-hmm. but the, the 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 product and the, the lack of careness, they're always looking for another job every offseason. That shit old, oh, fam. Mm-hmm. That four and, old four and six in the last ten, two and six against Power Five uh, in the last uh, eight and ten games, respectively. Um, just just not good. You know, Florida has a couple of not good teams ahead of them after Georgia uh, with Missouri, South Carolina, Sanford, and Florida State. Uh, so you can still salvage a decent season. But looking back at it, I mean, uh, nobody, this, man. This, like, I don't right, foresee us beating Georgia and the rest of that schedule. Ain't nobody. So you right. And then you have wins. to win. Right, and then you don't you don't pay Dan Mullen to be the sixth highest paid coach in college football to, to get eight wins two seasons in a row, uh, especially when you should theoretically have you know pretty good team on paper uh, talent wise. Uh, they got a lot of great transfers that came in. Uh, there's a lot of you know, a lot of huge question marks. Um, but everybody's complaining get, about the star ranking, but we lost to less talented teams. Like, yeah, we we filled the more talented mm-hmm. teams to Kentucky, than Kentucky, mm-hmm. Kentucky and LSU. Mm-hmm. We were more talented than both of those teams. Mm-hmm. Period. Yeah, they're more talented than LSU last year. The crew stinks, but that had those those he got out coached. Mm-hmm. I don't think At he least. cares. I think he's trying to get an NFL job every offseason. I don't think he cares. He's he's not bought in. Yeah, at That's least, just straight up. He's not. At least they're recruiting well. So it'll give you something to look forward to in the offseason. Who's recruiting? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Nick almost he almost got me, man. He almost, <laughs> almost got you. All right. So we're going to talk a lot more about this discussion in a minute, but before we do that, uh, we're going to bring on former all American Shannon Snell uh, on to talk about the state of the program, maybe talk some barbecue. Uh, but before we do that, let's give a shout hey, out to our friends over at home field apparel. Uh, if you're looking for a vintage Gator t-shirt, maybe a 1996 fun and gun offense type of shirt when they won the national championship, Maybe you're looking at the old Charlie Pell logo. Maybe when times were good and you want to rock a logo from a time that you felt uh, excited about the uh, the football team, go check out our friends over at Home Field Apparel. Use Stadium and Gale at checkout. You get 15% off. Soft shirts, great uh, great graphics, a lot of new designs coming out. Uh, it's almost Christmas season. 
Um, as, as you know, big Christmas guy around here, but the supply chain's messed up this year. So get your stuff ordered now and get it ordered quickly. Uh, so it's in time and in your gift wrapping box before December 25th. Again, Stadium and Gale at checkout, 15% off. Let's get our friend Shannon on the show. Shannon, how are you doing, my friend? What's up? What's up, Dan? How you doing, buddy? So, what's up, buddy? What's up, my guy? How y'all doing, man? Man. Ah, right, man, a little therapy session, getting through it. How you feeling? I'm good, man. I'm. <laughs> we all on the same page looking at, <laughs> you know, what happened this past weekend, man. Just... I'm in a bad spot, man. I'm, I'm kind of stuck in that road between having to be kind of a supporter and just being pissed off with where we are, especially on the on the coach side. It's frustrating, bro. Yeah, bro. It's just, uh, you know, it just – I don't think I'm so much disappointed in the offense. The offense came back and, you know, Dan's got his mm -hmm. issues with um, having to find the right guy to start. We all know who the right guy is, but I think Dan and this whole – seniority thing i think that's a real deal thing but i'm you know it's, it's, but if it's at one spot snail is that more spots i'm sorry if it's at one spot is that more spots yeah i mean you know that's what it is and that's that's my problem is and it's it's so it's pretty apparent on the defensive side of the ball where you know todd grantham needed to be gone i think that's that's you know that's probably mm -hmm. uh, everybody that's watched the football game in the past two two and a half years um, that follow any sort of Florida football realizes our defenses have haven't been good, right? We keep we keep talking about this whole um, Gator standard thing, which I totally believe in, and I think Dan believed it when he walked into the doors in 2018. But you know, you take about you think about this year. What is our only we our only quality win in 2021 is Tennessee, right? Mm -hmm. We we beat FAU, we beat USF, and we beat Vanderbilt. After that, it, it's it's Tennessee, and Tennessee's not a great team this year. So we're looking at a basically a four and three record and we've lost. And even going back last year, we're talking about losing to Bama, losing to Oklahoma, you know, the games that counted, it's really not the Gator standards, not there. It's not really a thing at this point in time. So yeah, we got to oh. quit saying it unless moves are going to be made to, to get, bring us back to that, that Gator standard that he's talking about. Well, Florida is really four and four this year. As you remember after the cotton bowl, Dan said that wasn't the 2020 team. Uh, so we, we put that loss on the 2021 team and now it's a, a four and four Florida team. Um, he's creative I, with his spins, though. I gotta give listen, him. man. He's good. I, I, my sarcasm, he's got future works politics. Well. My, my sarcasm works well when I'm covering uh, underachieving football teams. Um, I kind of, I kind of, I kind of asked Dan uh, about that Gator standard, Snell, and, and I'm like, listen, was that a marketing ploy? Did someone from marketing come down before your first, your first press conference and say, hey, say the Gator standard? It's gonna get people excited. Um, you asked him like right that. Now, no, I, I was respect more respectful than that. Oh, okay. I, about I, I asked, I asked, I asked him, I asked him what the Gator <laughs> standard was because you're two and six in your last eight um, sure. against against Power Five teams. Is that the Gator standard? How do you get back to it if that's not it? And uh, so they have to evaluate. So I'm not, uh, you know, attacking the work that goes into being able to play football and, and the strain that you have to do. But you're if, the, if you're the head coach and you're trying to sell that this is what we do as a program, this is our championship standard. You got you got to stand in the paint and explain to me what that is because you're not showing it right now. No, he's not showing it. And I think the I think it's been the excuses. I think we've all been very much uh, aware about what's going on. And you know, I think the the fact of our fan base or you know our our beat reporters or anybody that's covering Florida football can see what's going on. I think Dan sometimes discredits him and, and plays him as stupid. Like, hey, you guys aren't in our meeting room. You guys don't see. You know, he closed off practice. And I think that whole thing closing off practice is a little bit telling as well, as you probably know, is that a lot of times you close off practice because there's something that that they don't want people to see or want people to hear or want people to cover. And Anthony, you know, Anthony could be tearing it up in practice, right? But he doesn't want Jumping you writing about Anthony. This, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't want you writing about Anthony. <laughs> you know, you. Emory could be out. Emory could be out there throwing picks all in practice. He may not want you to cover that. So I, I get him, and I can appreciate the fact as as a former player, him trying to back his guys, especially the guys that have been sitting in the program and doing, you know, had blood, sweat, and tears, and had the reps, and you know, waited for their time. Because I give Emory all the credit in the world. He had to sit behind Kyle Trask for a couple of years at Felipe, and you know, he bought he bought his time, but. Dan is going to – one thing in this in this game is that loyalty will get you killed if it's, if it's affecting your record, if it's affecting your job. And that's for that's what's happened with Dan, with Todd Grantham. It happened with Emory because he's backing Emory to the end of the earth. And, and unfortunately, 
you're, you're really not playing for anything now, right? Mm-hmm. You're sticking AR in there, and it's going to be a I told you so moment. And this is this is this is a this is a, uh, a worse for worse for Dan because let's say AR comes in and wins the rest of the game. Let's say he competes against Georgia. They won't. They probably won't pull it off. But let's say he competes and gets them. You know, the rest of the wins minus the Georgia game, right? You're going to have everybody clamoring to the fact of why wasn't this kid starting before that? Mm-hmm. And I, I, I think that's a legit, that's a fair argument. How how can you put a guy that's done everything that he's that he's done in, in these football games? That's every time he's came in, minus the Vanderbilt game, he's made splash plays. He's really tore shit up, and it's just you know, how do you not put that? How do you not see that yourself or any mm-hmm. or any normal fan sitting in stands and? You know, I, I think Dan's just being a victim of him being being, being hard-headed. I just think he's mm-hmm. like, hey, I'm going to stick to my guns. This is what I've done when I was at Mississippi State. This is what I did when, you know, since I got the head coaching range. It's going to kill him. It's, mm-hmm. it's going to kill him. It's going to kill him sooner than later. Yeah, I was talking to Nick last night about it. And, you know, Dan Mullen has been infatuated with Emory Jones since he was a sophomore. I think in high school and wanted him to go to Mississippi State. Obviously, he couldn't get him to come to Mississippi State. He ends up bringing him. He's the first kid that Florida offers. Uh, they get Matt Corral out of the class, who, as of today, is not a Heisman Trophy favorite. You bring Emory Jones in. You have him sit behind Felipe Franks, Kyle Trask, and he gets his opportunity to play. And it's that loyalty and that desire probably to want to say that I'm this quarterback whisperer, I'm the best quarterback coach in college football, whatever the case may be, that couldn't end up unraveling something that, you know, he spent 15, 16 years trying to develop, uh, you know, either at the University of Florida as offensive coordinator, as head coach. And um, I think we're seeing it in front of our eyes right now. Well, I think this really affects you. Go Go back to go back to a couple of years ago. Why was you, you got to ask yourself back in 2018? Why why was Felipe the guy? Mm-hmm. Right? We we knew Kyle Trask was better when Kyle Trask got into the game. He just happened to prove it. And we were saying to ourselves, "Hey, how did this guy? How, how did Felipe Franks start over the start over this guy that had just all the tools? Heisman Trophy finalist last year would ultimately affect what what what's what's going with Emory right now? Because Emory last year, Felipe should have been on the shelf a long time ago. He just wasn't the guy." And at that point in time, uh, Emory should have been getting meaningful snaps in those games last year, and he wasn't. He, he basically came out of the gate fresh. He might have got a couple of snaps last year that was at the end of the game or whatever that was, but it really affected his progression to get in a live game. So when Dan rolls out this year, he's saying, you know what, if I throw this guy in a game, it's going to be fine. We're just going to work through it until you stick Anthony Richardson in the game and he starts blowing things up. Now he created a he created his own quarterback controversy. This is not the fault of – Anybody else but Dan Mullen himself. I mean, we had guys like Chris Dorian come over here preseason before the, the first game kicked off and said, uh, Anthony Richardson need, needs to be the quarterback. He needs to be like this kid's generational. Uh, Chris Dorian, the practices are closed, but they're letting guys like that behind the scene. They're coming to tell us the facts. And then what we as soon as the game started getting played, we like everybody st- started realizing that Chris Dorian wasn't just starting trying to get no clickbait. He had a, a real take. Um and we're not going to play the absolute best players and we're going to do this seniority thing, um, not fire coaches. Like, we got a little league team. We're playing yeah, so football, fam. Bro, you, you got to realize that how much this affects recruiting, too, is that if Dan's getting this this reputation for only playing seniority or playing the guys that have been in the program for a couple years, then he can never be – you know, you got some freshmen coming out of high school now that are ready. These guys are ready to play real-time college football. And if you're a great player and you're th- saying to yourself, hey, I'm choosing between a Florida and Alabama, Georgia, like it always comes down to, why would I choose Florida if I know I'm going to sit the bench for two or three years, right? Especially now that this NIL bill has came out and these guys are, mm-hmm. some of these guys are making millions of dollars. Like, you're going to go to a spot where in the first two years of your career, you can end up making Bro, I don't even want to go money. practice right, Snell. Like, I don't want to yeah, go to practice. I, mean, I got to sit two years, fam. Yeah. Like, like what am I like, going to practice? I'm chilling. Bro, that's like the thing. Like I, that that should work back in the day when you had to come in, you had to be redshirted and all that stuff, and you had to sit, and then hopefully you got your opportunity. Look, that that that's that's a thing of the past. If Dan's gonna live in the past, then he's gonna get passed up like he's doing right now. I think that's the part that's affecting uh, the recruiting process. Well, n- maybe not even the recruiting process now, but you you damn well better believe that a lot of these guys are taking a look at this and saying, "Hey, look, why are you still playing Emory?" And then this this report coming out about him. You know, having issues playing guys and they need to earn their keep in the practice field and all this other shit. Look, let me let me tell you something. I'm a, I'm gonna quote my dude AI, Alan Iverson is like, we talking practice, right? Practice. Right. Some right. guys when those when those lights come on, when that when that Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening gets here, they just perform. And I, I really don't I personally don't give a shit what 
what he does in practice. If Anthony Richardson goes into that game and he's doing most of everything, if he's getting the script, if he's getting the playbook, and he's creating nah, plays he's doing in, practice, in practice, though, Snell. he's doing that in practice. He's jumping over. Right, well, I know practice, he's man. I know he's doing it in practice, but the reason the same thing going back to why guys like Nick aren't allowed in practice is because that shit is happening in practice. Right. And they don't want he doesn't want Nick putting out in the out in the paper because it's just going to create more fire, more fire that hey, why isn't this kid playing? Even though Dan may have his own reasons or own 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 ambitions on why he shouldn't. I was beating the Kyle Trask drum because we used to be allowed him to practice. We were allowed right. to practice, and Kyle Trask and uh, Felipe both came in that same spring. We're watching spring practice, and I'm like, dude, that two star you guys were clowning Jim McWayne for taking that kid can throw the ball. I'm like, I don't know if he can run or, or do other things. I'm like, but this kid can spin it. Um, it it's, it's funny. I need to put, I need to get you some of those like Google glasses, those Snapchat glasses. Snow, we'll send you out to practice and I'll just, I'll just watch your live stream. Bro, I, I just, you know, it's one of those things I never want to, you know, be a point where I'm not supporting the program. But you guys know, um, you know, I take the bad and try to look at it, put on some good glasses. But, you know, it's, it's super apparent right now, man, that. You know, the state were four and three and no no hope to win the SEC. Obviously, the goals are, you know, to win the SEC, make it to the SEC championship, then try to make it to the college football playoffs. Those are always the top three goals every single year. And they have been for since this whole play, uh, college football playoff has came along and even the BCS era. But now it's like you, you don't have anything to play for. And you think about it real quick. It's like, what is the motivation for these guys? What is the motivation for Kyrie Elam? What is the motivation for, for Trey Dean and – and Zach, I, even though I know a guy like Zach is going to continue to NFL. compete, he's that kind of dude. Yeah, the, it, the NFL right place is that for field. Now, at this point, man. Yeah, and that's a scary place to be, bro. Because think about for it: sure. it's, you don't you don't have your team, or Dan's going to be preparing for next year's team because some of these guys are like, "Hey, I got an injury," or they go up to him and say, "Hey, I'm not going to be playing." What, what does that do for the, not only the program? What does that do for the program recruiting? What does that do for the boosters? People watching the football, the stadium is that going to be filled up? I, I can't. You know, our next home game is against what, uh, Sam Stanford or whoever it is. So Stanford, you best yeah. Well, yeah, you best well, but you better believe that that stadium. I, I'd be surprised if it has seventy thousand people there, and it's just because of the fact of we are not playing good football. And, and let's not let's admit if Georgia blows us out, it's going to get real, real hot for them. Mm-hmm. It um, it was interesting. I was talking to Dan, and I think you're in a no win situation. Anyway. You're in a no win situation yeah. with with the Georgia game. If you mm-hmm. win, if you lose by a point. It's why didn't you play like this against Kentucky mm-hmm. and against LSU? If you get blown out, not going to be happy that you got blown out to, to a rival. And even if you win the game, what the hell does that matter? George is still going to win the East. Right. And why didn't you play like this against LSU mm-hmm. and against Kentucky? And then let them this week, and we'd be in, in Atlanta playing Alabama. No, I, I think, I think he's lost the fan base. This At this point, yeah. I, think, I do think he's lost the fan base. Well, I think I think, I, I, it's, I, I think, so. I think it's gimme. I think it's gimme's up. I mean, that was with Alabama. Like you go into Alabama, you play. You know, we don't believe in moral victories. I, I I'm not about that. But in the same breath, it's like you know, you saw the best of them, right? So you gave them the moral victory happened, and that's that comes with the territory of playing Alabama that early in the season. Is that you know, if you win, great. But it, but but the expectation is you need to win the rest of your games because Alabama's the best. But mm-hmm. if you win, if you lose close, that means hey, you, at least you guys. At least you guys, we know you're there. We know what you can do. So now that you lose two more games to much lesser opponents, it, there's no more. There's no more. Hey, if, if they lose to uh, Georgia by one point, his gimme has gone. His his moral quote unquote moral victory is gone. The, the fan base is going to even they're going to still be pissed, as mm-hmm. well as they should be. It's, it's only a fair conversation to have because of the fact that no matter what, like, a, a, if you were if you had beaten Alabama and beaten the rest of those teams, and then you lose to Georgia by one point. Yeah, you still are in the conversation of, you know, not maybe not the SEC East because I don't see anybody beating Georgia, but you're in the conversation for at least a college football playoff. You're in the you're in the conversation for making your making your case. Losing to Georgia puts you at four and four, and there's really nothing beneficial of losing the game. Period. Yes, winning the game because you never want to lose to Georgia, but uh, you know, losing close is not an option. He has to win that game, even though it, it looks really bleak right now. I mean, there's it's win or nothing. Not even playing close. That's just not getting any play right now. Yeah, I think um, a few a few things was what really hurting him. Um, keeping Grantham, like because mm-hmm. sometimes you take a step back. Sometimes you lose a generational offense like we had last year that just put up crazy numbers and Kadarius Tony and Kyle Pitts. Sometimes you just lose those type of athletes, um, and that and that's cool. Like the fans get that, but when they see Anthony Richardson, um, like he should be starting. 
Uh, they see the recruiting. It's not getting any better. Like, that's the offseason is horrid. It's not fun to watch in the offseason. Like, we're not recruiting well. Uh, you're not playing the best players. Todd Grantham still has his job, so you're complacency and keeping friends. Like, what's – like, that's what – like, it's just a lot. Like, what does he have to lean on at all? Like, sometimes – like, like Dabo having a bad year, right? Um, but yeah, I mean – so many other things are good, like recruiting, mm -hmm. uh, the staff, like everything else around the program is kind of there's like a, flowing. There's a hope or optimism, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, like you just said it. I mean, loyalty is going to get you killed. Like that's – like he's been so loyal to Grantham. And, you know, we joke about it. Does Grantham have pictures on him or, or something like maybe – like him up in the club like Urban? You know, I don't know what it is. But, you know, anybody else that – nobody get, comes to work and gets paid to suck at their job. You get you suck at your job, you get fired. You get raises and, right here. Yeah, you know, you're getting raises or you're getting extensions around here. I just – I totally don't understand it. And there's always been this thing where he said, you know, well, Todd has been great and – you know, our, our defense two years ago was ranked number 16, was ranked, you know, whatever that may have been. And, um, you know, I, I just – I don't get that. I think sometimes Dan has this, has this thing where he's speaking – where he's trying to defend this guy even though he shouldn't be. And I, I appreciate that he does that, um, especially if, if Grantham had a great track record or if Grantham mm – -hmm. uh, if his defenses were performing well or if guys now are not now calling him out in the media – if his guys understood and were standing at bat, standing up on the podium for him. But you could tell, you could tell by, by Diabate that he just said, you know what? He didn't say, hey, I, I support Todd Grantham. He didn't say any of that. He basically said, you know, I support my guys in the locker room. And let me tell you something. That happened a while ago. That happened during the Ron, Ron Zip era is when mm -hmm. everything started to go to shit. The guys in the locker room said, hey, at least we're going to rally around each other. It doesn't really matter what mm -hmm. the, who the coach is at this point. Mm -hmm. We're going to rally around each other, still try to make this a season, and still try to be successful. At that point in time, when you lose that locker room, it ain't, it ain't no getting it back. There's nothing you can do uh, short of a miracle and getting that locker room back once it gets to that point. Yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to ask you about that. I was looking at the – I mean, you you came in with Spurrier. I mean, 10-2, and two, uh, as Spurrier left, left the building, said, you know, 10-2 isn't good enough anymore. Uh, and then Ron Zook comes in, um, and I think it was 8 Eight wins the first year, and then I'm looking at the 2003 your your uh, your All American season. You guys, I think, start off three and three, beat San Jose State, lose at Miami, beat FAMU, lose to Tennessee, beat Kentucky, lose to Ole Miss. What happens then in the locker room? Is that what you were just talking about? Where you're like, hey, we just need to rally around each other because this isn't it. Yeah, bro. I mean, that's really what it got down to. We I basically, and to give you guys a little bit of insight. Is that during the team meeting after that loss, we were about to go into LSU, and LSU was ranked what number two or three at the mm -hmm. point, a number almost no, I think maybe number one. I don't remember, but we had to go into LSU and play them, and we basically told the coaches to leave the meeting. Uh, we had that Monday morning meeting where oh, you know basically uh, old it, 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 players only. Uh, bro, it was it, it was a players only meeting. It was like you know we that's when you know we got this shirt made that said team across the front. It had a big gator said team across the front. We basically kicked all the coaches out and said, hey, you guys need to leave because it's not really on you at that point. And it wasn't at that point where we thought, you know, we, we, we didn't buy into the coaches. But I think the coaches knew that they were starting to lose the locker room. There was a lot of stuff that was being called. There was a lot of things being done um, that just didn't make sense. Um, you know, for me personally, I didn't think Ron Zook could coach his way out of a paper bag. And I think the sentiment was, uh, was the same among a lot of guys. So with that being said, it's like, hey, we call the players only meeting and say, hey, look, we need to get this together if we want to salvage a good season, if we want to go mm -hmm. to a New Year's Day Bowl at that time. And, you know, ultimately, you know, the Gators might be at that point. You know what I'm saying? And offensively, I'm not going to hold it against Dan because offensively we're explosive. He probably made the move at the wrong time. He's got to be a ma better manager uh, of his people. Um, but yeah, offensively, I, like, yeah. Not just the I, staff, I, I, like, like, I just don't. Can you fix? Can you fix the, those issues though? Like, I, like that's a philosophy change. This is a reoccurring theme between stops. Um, it, it, how do you fix two, that? That that loyalty and also like the seniority. It, listen, there, there's two weeks. There's two weeks that they have to get ready for Jordan. But in these two weeks, it's probably going to be the most important two weeks of the season. Like he's got to make some significant changes because if you're if you're sitting in your living room like any one of us for were. And we could point out that there's only six in a box and there's six blockers and they're going to keep running counter right down mm -hmm. your damn throat. If we can see that and the changes aren't being made, then the players go into the press, the, to the presser after the game and say, you know, you know, we're just done. We're, we're, we're doing what we're told. Then there needs to be a significant change made at this point in the season to get the, to get the ship right. Because basically the players are saying, Hey, we don't believe in you. We don't believe in the bullshit you're selling. 
And if it gets to that point, if it goes on long enough, you can't get the players back. You can't get the team mm-hmm. back because you got 70 different kind of personalities in that locker room, some of them stronger than others. Um, but it, it, getting getting half the team to buy back in is almost like saying getting nobody to buy back in because you mm-hmm. need everybody on the same page. That's just what it is on a football team, team sport. And right now, Dan is at that crossroad. He's at a crossroad where he's got to choose loyalty to Ty Grantham or choose getting this football team back on the same page and, and keeping his job. You know, Shannon, this is a, a, something that I talked to. Nick and I had a fantastic conversation, which you could have recorded. We had, we had some it was gems fine. in there. It was just fine. It was just fine. So, um, you know, I told Nick that my, my biggest concern is is apathy, right? Is is the opposite of of love isn't like hate. Or the, the worst feeling to have is the opposite of love is, is apathy, right? And that's where I unfortunately – feel right now. I feel like there's apathy towards decision-making that needs to be made from a personnel choice. Um, I think that there's decisions that need to be made that it's just like, oh, ho hum. Like, you know, you, you hear about Todd Grantham and you, you have questions about him after they give up the most rushing yards to a running back ever. And the response is, well, we'll look at it at the end of the season at, at the results. It's like, well, that to me is an apathetic answer. And my concern is that there's apathy in the fan base there's apathy in the program and if that turns into apathy amongst football players you've got a much bigger issue than just losing some football games that you should have won you've now got a culture issue that you can't easily get back that's a yeah, very hard thing to overcome you don't, you then, but uh, there's got to be a point in time and this is just human nature is that you got to have a c you got to have a cya moment you got to cover your ass because dan came here and he's the sixth highest paid coach in college football. Mm-hmm. He gets paid to make tough decisions, whether it be not starting a kid, pulling a scholarship, putting a kid There's on a scholarship. A yeah, yeah. You, you, he gets paid to make these kind of decisions. Sometimes mm-hmm. I, I don't care if Dan Mulligan call an offensive play. Matter of fact, he can hire somebody for that. Mm-hmm. I don't care if Dan Mulligan call a defensive play. He can hire somebody for that. But when Dan Mullen approves or when he uh, says it's okay for the, the program or something to be in the state that it's in right now, then that's when you have a problem, right? Nick Saban, Nick Saban. One of the one of the reasons everybody that comes from under Nick Saban goes on to succeed is because they're good managers of people. They watch Nick Saban, what he does, mm-hmm. and says, "Hey, I want to be able to mimic that. I want to be able to be a good leader." And that's what good leaders do. I once again, it doesn't get back to calling X's and O's. We know Dan can do that. Dan's done it under Urban. He's done it for a, a good majority of his career. And I think there needs to be a little bit of a separation of saying, "Hey, if Dan wants to be an offensive coordinator, cool. Let him step down, go somewhere else, be an offensive coordinator because he can do that really well." But when it comes to being a head coach, can he – does he have the balls to really to, to let those balls drop and make the tough decisions? I don't know because it hasn't happened, you know, and, and it, he can't make it out to be, well, the, fl- the fans don't know or you guys are seeing something different or, you know, whatever that may be. He's got to be able to have the nuts to do that. And right now, mm-hmm. if he continue, if – and like I said, these two weeks are going to be very telling. If he goes into these two weeks and nothing happens, nothing happens defensively, nothing happens, no situational changes – even if he doesn't fire Todd Grantham, which I don't think he will, and he loses that Georgia game by a big amount, and they, if we end up getting blown up defensively, then Dan Mullen should conceivably maybe be looking for another job at the end of the season because he can't make if he can't make that decision if he can't if he can't make the tough decisions then why is he here? And that's he's my thing. Team, it is, he's the smartest person in every room that he's ever been into, Snell, and I think that when you're winning football games. That's fine. You, you can be the most unliked, disliked person in the world, cocky, arrogant, really turn people off. But if you're winning football games, you're going to have a job. You can be the nicest guy in the world. I think it was like a funeral the day that they fired Muschamp in, in, in the UF building because everyone loved him. Um, but if you're not winning football games, they'll, they'll get you on up out of there. It doesn't matter if you're, you know, the Pope. They'll get rid of you. Do you think there's no, you're any, right. any – go ahead, go ahead. You're right, and 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 the thing is, in, in year one, year two, you know, Dan was winning football games, and and a lot of people talk about his cockiness. A lot of people talk about him, you know, you know his the way he answers questions or whatever. I actually have no problem with that, right? Because you know, Steve Spurrier was the same way. Steve was one of the cockiest sons of bitches that you could ever meet. But the thing between Dan and Steve is that Steve was winning. He was winning. He had won a national championship. He had won multiple SEC titles. Um, and, and for Dan in his first two years, I think he could afford to be that because he had taken Florida 
uh, back to a place where Urban, kind of a shadow of where Urban was at. He was starting to win games, New Year's Day Bowls. But now that you're in a spot that you're losing, somebody said it best on Twitter where they said, you know, the difference between having a bad attitude uh, when, when you're losing games with a bad attitude, when you're winning games, it's called having swagger, right? And mm. I think that's like – I think that's – like the perfect analogy. So I don't have a problem with him, his attitude. I don't have a problem with him being a little bit cocky. The problem I have with Dan is making the tough decision in his, in, in his coaching staff, in his meeting rooms. Like, mm-hmm. is he going to do that? Because the, right now it's killing him. It's killing this program. My biggest like, problem there's, there's, is he just looks checked out. Like mm-hmm. he's looking for a new job every off season. Um, Kentucky, we just look unprepared. He looks checked out. One thing, losing football games in a hard fought battle, but when you go out there looking like a goof show and you just like, you know, this guy, you know, the, like how smart he is, right? We're talking about how smart he is. Some of the stuff he's putting out there just don't look like a good product. And like he's like he's checked in. Uh, Spurrier well, so and Irving was checked in when they was trying to like Spurrier may have won eight games some season, right? But he always was checked in. He wasn't looking for NFL jobs every offseason. Well, Silk, I, I, I just, it, it pains me to say that he could stand there during the entire, the entire course of that LSU game and just watch them continuously run the same play and same not play. say anything. Mm-hmm. Not not Check take them out. into – like even like halftime adjustments, like not take them in – hit them in the face, take them in there and be like, hey, what the hell are you doing, Todd? Hey, the same things exist as a head coach when you have to step in there. You don't have to know the defense. You don't have to know it, but you do have to go over there and say, hey, maybe you need to switch some stuff up, bring guys in the box, do something. Or even as a regular fan, just say, hey, look, play man to man and put put nine or – eight or nine guys into the box, like do something different because everything that happens in those four walls at Daniel Griffith Stadium is on Dan Mullen's back, including what Ty Grantham does. If he's not going to do anything about it, then it may need to be, it may need to be under control to somebody else. How happy would you have been to be an LSU lineman last weekend when all of a sudden every play call is just, Hey, counter power, counter power, just go punch somebody in the mouth. Play, John keep doing this. Us, it's like a man game. Let's, just keep running let's, back. Let's, well, it, same it, play. It, it is, and even in the damn Madden game, the, the artificial intelligence will make a play at a certain point and switch right. to a different defense. So, right. hey, you know, if I'm an LSU lineman, bro, it's like, you got to be kidding me. Like, there should there should have been no reason that running back who, uh, you know, who who got hot the week before, there should have been no reason that this dude runs for almost 300 yards. He's not that damn good. He was no Clinton Portis. He was no Willis He McKay. ran for more than he Herschel not- ran for yeah, yeah, Herschel Walker. Walker. Yards Herschel down Walker. He, was, he was 10 yards down the field for somebody that, like, touched him. It's insane to me. Like, as, as I'm watching this, man, and, I, you know, I was in a spot, you know, moving some stuff out, and I was just, you know, out of a place, and I'm just like, how does this, like, like I'm counting the number of guys in the box, and I'm counting the number of guys on LSU's line. I'm like, how, he does realize a six-on-six, six, not counting the quarterback and the running back. Mm-hmm. So he's putting six bodies on six bodies, and the, le- the, guy on the, end of the, the guy on the end of the line of scrimmage is being held by the quarterback. So we're definitely out flank- flanked, and the safety's not even going to get to him because – you know, Trey Dean, is just, he was just having a terrible game at that point or, or being directed to have a terrible game. I don't know which one it was. But, you know, at that point in time, it's like, who's – yeah, probably both. But who's making the call to say, hey, we need to switch things up? And if Dan – like I said, if Dan wants to be an offensive coordinator and say, well, I don't know anything about defense, I'm going to just let Todd handle it, then that is on him. That is 100%. That's not a Todd Grantham thing. That's on Dan. No, because I've seen Dan, Dan scream at Todd him. before. I've seen him scream at Todd before. He, no, screamed I down, he screamed at him last week. He he was going. He does this little thing. It's like he doesn't want to get into his face for so long that the TV picks it up. So he does like these drive-by screams at Todd. Yeah. He'll, he'll pace. Oh, I like he that. He paces past him. Boom, yells at him and keeps going. Then he comes back. Boom, yells nah, at him see, and keeps see, going. I need a full-fledged Nick Saban. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, get in his shit. <laughs> yeah, like, full-ass shit. Like, like, yeah, bro. Like, give me full-fledged Nick Saban, man. Yeah, so, I think that – Go ahead, all right, no, I just I think it's at the point right now. You know, I am confident in – listen, I, I'm confident in Dan Mullen. Dan Mullen and his play-calling abilities. But I'm, I'm not, not confident – what his play – if you think about this, and I think we – his hand was forced. I think I think Anthony forced his hand at, play, at making him the quarterback. Now, if, if Emory Jones runs out into that, that – that, into Jacksonville as a starting quarterback, I'm going to cut off the TV. Yeah. Because, we, I mean, yeah. he's proven oh, that uh, we're, we're all cutting off the TV, right? No, for sure. Point, I'm definitely going to do something better with my Saturday evening. If they go, <laughs> not, like, not that, no slight, no slight to him, but I just know they don't care. Like, you know what I'm saying? So if that if that's the case, then I got to go do something better with my time for sure. The only, the only reason Emory and nothing against Emory because I like him. I think he would be, you know, successful. Maybe given a little bit more time. It's just a guy that's better than you. Isn't it? it should be in front of you. Uh, so you know, it's at the point that if 
you know, Dan, if Emory comes running out, I'm cutting off that game. But at this point in time is that Dan, I'm, I'm confident in him as a play caller. He needs to make some decisions on his staff, whether it's taking over the defense. I don't know if he can do that. But, you know, but the whole Grantham thing, I just – I don't know if he can pull that trigger. Grantham's a buddy mm-hmm. of his. And, you know, with that being said, is can he separate the, the, the lines of friendship and work? I don't think he's been able to do that at this point in time. I, I think now that his seat is a little bit hotter, I think this really will be a telling tale. Um, mm-hmm. And I, like I said, this is going to be the most important two weeks of his of his four year stint at Florida. Is what mm-hmm. he does adjustment wise to get himself prepared because I think he'll have another year, even if Dan loses the rest of his games this year. I still think tell Dan you, will I have another you, year. Better not have it. We firing people yet? I, I, I firing Dan better not have another year. No, Dan. <laughs> Dan, Dan I, I don't think safe. we should. I, I don't think the school's gonna fly uh, fire. Yeah, no, I don't uh, think. The I'm not gonna say fire. we shouldn't. Um, I don't know but if he cares, this, bro. Don't this like is this is I guess this is my thing. I, I talked about it today on, on Twitter because I I hire a lot of people. I, I work in a business that helps hire people. Hiring is is very very challenging. But Dan Mullen is the CEO of a hundred and fifty two hundred million dollar enterprise, right? And he has a bunch of you will call them employees, players, and then he's got his executive team around him, his coaches. You can be very good at one company, get hired to another company, and it, it maybe just doesn't work out. Maybe the things that you did that made you successful somewhere else aren't the things that make you successful here. And Dan Mullen is the CEO of the Florida football program right now, and he's got to make those decisions for the investors, the, the fans, the people that spend money and everything else. And he's got to make that decision very, very, very quickly because this is when we know this is when we separate Dan Mullen, the chance. Now you talked about him, the, the football coach, the guy calling the plays, the guy that can develop a great offensive scheme to Dan Mullen, the CEO. Dan Mullen's not the offensive coordinator. Dan Mullen is the CEO of this football program. And now is his time to make that decision. And even if it's sacrificial, we're not talk, calling Todd Grantham, not getting, you know, re-signed sacrificial at all. But this is when you have to make big decisions to show the investors in your business that you are serious about your job. And that's where I'm at for the first time ever under Dan Mullen's uh, coaching. Well, and it's, but it's that loyalty. Like I said, and, and just like in the drug game, loyalty will get you killed. And this is the same thing we're talking about in Florida football or any, anywhere in any big, big time college football program is that this loyalty will get you killed because, you know, these same problems, Dan, have existed for the last couple of years. And I get the fact that, Dan will always reference back, or there will be some of these, you know, standards that will always reference back. Well, we had a great defense or good defense back in 2018, or, or you know, the beginning of 2019. And, and I'll even give them a pass last year because last year they only had so many padded practices. There was a lot of stuff that just couldn't happen because of COVID. I get that part, right? But if the same issues that that existed one and a half year ago or that existed all of last year are still existing now then it's probably time to make a change. I just, you know, I, I just, I'm having a tough time believing that Dan could pull that trigger without saying, well, if he goes, I go too. And if he's willing to do that, then you know what? I stand for him because of that loyalty. But, mm-hmm. you know, get somebody into the program that's going to, that wants to win football games without having their buddies around. And that's just kind of where I'm at with it. I think it's easy this year to get rid of Grantham because his contract's up at the end of the year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it's easy just to let him ride out the length of his contract and, and hey, we're not renewing Todd. Go find a new defensive coordinator. So you have to make more decisions, though. Um, yes. It is Christian Robinson, a guy that, that you don't need around anymore. Uh, David Turner, I think the defensive line's played well. Um, the other two guys on defense are new. Um, I, I don't envision him – getting rid of Billy Gonzalez, not that he needs to, the wide receivers, the the guys he's getting in, the way that he's putting guys in the league, he's earning his paycheck. I don't see him getting rid of John Hevesy. They've been together since Bowling Green. They've been together 21 years. That's his dude. He will go down on the John Hevesy ship. If that's a move you think he needs to make, I don't see it happening. But I do see, at this point, the way things have gone, I don't see Ty Grantham getting another contract with Florida. No, you're right. I, I think, the, uh, well, first of all, I think Hevesy needs to stay because he's shown, like, with, with the line, that what happened with the line this year, last year was a little bit, you know, it was bad, and, you know, but you're asking them to drop back 50 times a game. And this year, they, they look really good, minus the, the Kentucky game where I think they lost a lot of one-on-one battles. They look really good. I think Hevesy is not the problem. Billy G, I think Billy G is part of the solution. Even with this year, I don't think the, the wide receiver group has is as talented as it's been in, in years past. 
Um, and, and even we're talking Christian Robinson. I know a lot of times people have been down on him, and it's been it's because him and him and Grantham have been tied at the hip. But you, everybody had been talking about he was one of the best um, young coaches in the game. Does a great job recruiting. Uh, I, I think he needs to kind of stand in his own shadow for a while because he's been standing in Grantham. And I, I get it with the linebackers. I get you know you know the linebacker play hasn't been great. Um, I expected more out of Brenton Cox. I expected more out of a lot of guys that are playing right now. But I, I do think Christian Robinson. I, I'm, I'm a big believer in him for some odd reason. I think he's getting the most out of his guys, but I do think his his game, and I think uh, a, a lot of what he's trying to do is being overshadowed by one person, and that one person uh, obviously running the defense needs to be gone. So, mm-hmm. uh, and I, I think I think if you subtracting, adding is by subtracting. If you subtract that one equation, I think you know Florida gets better on defense. Now you can obviously sub him in, or you, you'll need a defensive coordinator. I don't think C. Rob is the guy right now, as I don't think a lot of even. Even, uh, you know, Crime Dog, I don't think they're the guys right now. I think maybe is a Charlie Strong if he's available. I think maybe Marquand Manuel if he's available. There's some guys out there that really could motivate and really could uh, mentor a guy like Christian Robinson, could, me- could mentor a lot of these younger guys to get better and to really make that Florida defense better. But right now, this just this whole formula with Grantham over that whole defensive system, as I think he is, it's not working, and I don't think it's working for the coaches. I don't think the coach is going to come out and tell you directly that, yeah, Grantham needs to be gone. But, you know, it's it's his system, his way, and and, and Dan will allow it, uh, will allow that. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Um, we're going to we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, after we uh, wrap up here, uh, Shannon. Um, I, you know, I, I think for me, I, I don't I don't see a world where Todd Grantham is gone and Christian Robinson is still here. I like Christian Robinson a lot as a person. Uh, Christian oh, Robinson is go, man. The whole side under of the tutelage ball. of Todd Grantham since he was a GA. Um, you know, I was surprised how hard Florida fought for him last year, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I didn't think that Florida's linebacker play was great. You know, he has an opportunity to go to Michigan. Uh, they upped his pay a bunch. Um, I think that David Turner is is proven that he's, he's good, um, good enough. Um, I think that the crime dog has enough experience and he's done fine. Um, you know, I still question, you know, the Jules Montaner hire, right. I don't know where he fell on the list, but I know it wasn't one, two, three, or four um, on that hire. So I think that you need to make some wholesale changes. If for anything, it is a going back to my example, it's a show to your investors that you're trying to make things right. Um, but I also fear, right? I think that Florida can pay a lot of money, but Dan Mullen has never been a guy that goes out and gets that big splashy hire, spends a bunch of money to go get that big splashy hire. And Florida needs a great defensive coordinator to come in to write this ship. Well, I mean, Dan, you got to take into account right now that I don't think Dan Mullen's seat has ever been hotter than what it is right now. He was at mm-hmm. Mississippi State. He wasn't counting on to win a championship. He was counting on to maybe pretend a little bit. He was counting on to kind of maybe – you know, be in the mid-tier to kind of maybe you know, win an Alabama game or win a game against LSU in the West every once every blue moon. But he was never counting on to be the guy. When you come to Florida, you're counting on to, you know, with the way our fan base is, the way our boosters are, the way, you know, the, our history, you're counting on to win football games. And I think with this with this seat being this hot, I think he's willing to spend that big money. He has to because there needs to be a splash a splash higher. Let's just say Todd Grant is gone. Let's let's hope that, Don, that Dan says, hey, I got to pull the trigger. Um, he's going to have to spend some money because his next hire is, a, 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 as a defensive coordinator, is going to define the rest of his tenure at the University of Florida. You can't go out mm-hmm. and say, well, I'm going to go hire another buddy because we saw how that worked out. We saw, you know, what Grantham's done and, and, and how that's been detrimental to the Florida football program. Mm-hmm. He's got to go out and get a guy, and he's got to get it right because if he doesn't get it right, once again, he controls everything in that four walls. Him and Scott Strickland mm-hmm. are going to sit down and have, probably have a tough conversation, mm-hmm. and he's going to say, hey, this is who I want as my defense coordinator. This is how much I want to pay him. If he's paying somebody basically minimum wage to come in there and because he's his buddy and he can go play golf with him on Sat on, on Sundays, then God bless him. You know, he might as well get ready to pack his shit and get up out of Gainesville. Well, because but not he, only that, not only that, Shannon, they they need to be willing to say, hey, whoever we bring in as our defensive coordinator can make any change that they want, right? If that means David Turner goes, if that means Crime Dog goes, if that means Jules goes, if that means C Rob goes. I mean, you're talking about not just spending two million dollars on a defensive coordinator per year, you're you, you, yeah, you, you can't hey, bring. Hey, we're willing a, to throw and a half million dollars. You can't bring a, co- a coordinator in and say, "Well, hey, listen, if you're taking the job, these are the guys you have to work with." And you're like, "Well, why? You can't handcuff me and put me in." 
Yeah, you know, I mean, maybe I get to know C. Robin. Hey, I want I want to keep him. He wants to stay. Right. David Turner. I know I know him. I've coached them before. He's great. I don't know these other guys. I want to bring my own guys in. Sure, you're running the show. No, That's I think you guys are ball. right. I think you guys are right. I think it start. It really does start at the top. And whoever that defensive coordinator, whoever it is, whoever he wants to bring in, he's going to have to do it. That's a part of being a splash hire. Now, I'm only saying if we're talking about, you know, if we're going to keep things the same, the state that we're going to keep them in, and, and maybe I'm just kind of contradicting myself. I mean, maybe the guy that comes in, he needs to be the guy that maybe overhauls the staff. I don't see it. I do see, you know, Christian Robinson as a as, as a good young coach that still needs some direction. I do see I do see David Turner as a guy that can really make really make football happen. And that same with Prime Dog, but in the same breath is that no matter what happens, that money that money needs to be money well spent and that needs that once again that's going to be this two weeks is the most important time for dan but that that next defensive coordinator is going to determine if dan stays at the university of florida because if he comes in and the guy comes in as you know they we end up ranking 100th in, in total defense and we give up a bunch of points we're not going to win these football games the sec is a scoring league right now and right now we 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 wasted that generational offense last year we won't see offense like that until we get another guy that comes along like that. When that all happened, I don't know. I don't know when we'll ever see another Kyle Pitts or, or Kadarius Tony or another Kyle Trask. Right yeah, now, they got, we, they got to wait till they juniors and redshirt juniors yeah. and seniors. Shannon. Right, right. But if Dan's gonna if Dan's gonna control the narrative, he's got Anthony Richardson, so he's got a problem on both sides of the line. Replace your defensive coordinator and play the best player. And the best player isn't just Anthony Richardson; it's everybody that is. It may be the the, the Marcus Bowman who's sitting on the bench and one of your most explosive guys, or it could be. Uh, Finley Graham, who should be returning punts at this point, at uh, this point in the season. I don't know if Dan's going to stick with that mantra. He might, like I said, he might as well get ready, to, uh, pack his stuff, and get up out of Gainesville. Hey man, the big three sports that Florida been on a steady decline, man. We'll yeah, I saw we'll have, I, I, have a conversation I, about that eventually. I saw a tweet that you know, there's no Florida team ranking in the top 25. First time since what 2011, 2012. That is not the standard, Shannon. Yeah, that's not the standard. And, you know, I, I could care less about Florida State, Miami, UCF, you know. But, you know, at this point at this point in the season, we should have never lost to Kentucky. We should have never lost to uh, LSU. And this is the LSU team that's beat us two years in a row and has scored over 30, like, with really bad teams. That, that true freshman quarterback start last year, you know, and, and this year them running the ball, basically not even having to throw the ball, scoring 49. You know, I said we're in a bad spot, and I, I don't know if two weeks can can correct the entire situation. But if, if Dan if Dan is serious about keeping his job and really showing that to, to Gator Nation and getting back to the Gator standard, then you know he's got he's got to do something. He's got to come out and put a strong step forward and make some statements. And the first statement would be, uh, would it be you me? know, making some people. Well, well, and, and, <laughs> you know, that's. Uh -huh. I, I think that's I think that's unexplained, bro. I think if Anthony Richardson doesn't walk out into Jacksonville, the very first and that very first snap, you're gonna hear a lot of boos, and it's not coming from Georgia fans; it's coming from Florida fans. It, it's it's an inevitable process. That's what's gonna happen, and I, I like to tell you that that's unfair, but it's not. Anthony's done enough to put himself in a spot where he's the starting quarterback for the University of Florida, and anybody else or anything else is would be totally uh, not right. It would be Stupid. Shannon, Shannon Snell took us to church tonight, guys. He did. Mm. Shout out to well, that brisket you cook for my man, Delance. So that thing look all right. I don't eat meat, but that thing look all right, Shannon. <laughs> you're making, you're well, making him think twice about his life. I'm a backslid, fam. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know, I spent all night on that brisket, bro. So uh, it, was it was beautiful. If you, if you ever get back to wanting to eat meat, I can get you some chicken wings. Mm. You can slide yeah, back yeah. in. I know you ain't gonna you ain't gonna do the pork. I know you ain't gonna do the red meat. But you can just get you some chicken. Sure. You know fire. You're not gonna waste time smoking some vegan brisket. I don't even know what what the inside of that. No, I, won't, <laughs> I, won't, I won't. I won't cook anything on my on my smoker that's vegan. So you might as well take that out. Don't do not crank up a grill for anything vegan, man. It cooks too way too fast, bro. I learned that my grill don't do anything no more. It's just back there rusty. Mm, bro, you got You just go pull some plants out of the garden and put it on your plate, man. That's, that's, right. that's where you're at right now. <laughs> that's where you're at, bro. Right. Not eating tree tree branches and stuff, Shannon. E eating like a rabbit. Yeah, yeah man. Uh, well, Shannon, we appreciate you uh, you coming onto the show as always. Uh, let everybody know where they can follow you on on Twitter, social media, all that kind of fun stuff. Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at uh, the Big Boss SS. 
I'm normally on there tweeting about gators and f- football and barbecue. Um, and, you know, like I said, or you can follow me. On, we got our Sonny's Facebook, uh, Sonny's Facebook page. You go to uh, Sonny's YouTube. Uh, follow me at Tales from the Pit. I do a lot of videos on there. Or you can follow, follow me at Relationship Ribs on Instagram. I post a lot mm-hmm. of pictures on there. You guys come on. I post, and, and you see, they, they're talking about the brisket right now. I post a lot of the good food on there as well, so. Well, Shannon, I went to, uh, the last time I was in Gainesville, I went to Sonny's before uh, going over to the tailgate, and uh, it was fantastic. So, so shout out to you and uh, your friends over at, uh, at Sonny's, and, and man, we're excited to have you on, hopefully at a, uh, at a better time in the uh, not-too-distant future. I appreciate it, guys. Thanks, uh, thank you all for having me on, man. Awesome. Right. We'll talk to you soon. Later, guys. Shannon Snell. Taking us wonder, to church. Wonder if we have a uh, parallels that I, I wanted to bring that up because he was the transition with uh, Spurrier to Zook, and then his last year. I mean, he was an All American, and and you start off, you know, three and three, and, and he literally said it there. He said, "Yeah, they lost the locker room. We we kicked the coaches out. Old school players only meeting." I'd be curious to see who on the team are those leaders to do that for this team. Uh, I mean, Bate got a lot of uh, army terms in, and like general <laughs> stuff he always says. So I think I, I go with him yeah. uh, on the defensive side. Oh, man, all right. Well, let's get let's get into the discussion that everybody's having. We obviously had it a bit with Shannon, but before we do that, let's give a shout out to our friends over at Game Time Sidekicks that sent us uh, some cups last week. Sent us some T-shirts. Nick, you're wearing the T-shirt. Silk has the uh, the cups in the uh, the back of his uh, display back there. There it is. Uh, check out Game Time Sidekicks, over 350 uh, different options to choose from in terms of schools, golf, things of that nature. Check them out. Uh, one of a kind, uh, just incredible products, vacuum sealed uh, cups, uh, very similar to Yeti. Got to have a vacuum much sealed, Dan. It's a must. It's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful cup there. So uh, University of Florida apparel, stadium gale cups, whatever it might be, uh, get, get something for a loved one. Uh, check them out, uh, GameTimeSidekicks.com. Promo code Stadium will get you 10% off. Again, GameTimeSidekicks.com, promo code Stadium. Really go check them out. Really, really, really quality products. Uh, really, really um, happy and with, this, uh, with our partnership the, with them. And the logo on this cup, so it's kind of like a matte finish. The logo is etched into it. So dishwasher safe, that bad boy is not going to come off. No, it's a, it's, a, it's a great, really, really quality product. So uh, we wouldn't say it if we didn't believe it. Uh, it truly uh, has been my cup since I've gotten one uh, over the last couple of weeks. And then last uh, last week, got three more to add to the collection. Now my entire uh, cabinet is uh, <laughs> Game Time Sidekick stuff. So, um, so again, GameTimeSidekicks.com, promo code Stadium. All right, so um, this discussion can be long or it can be short. We already had a little bit of uh, the discussion with Shannon Silk. I, I, I know your thoughts, uh, but you've been great about keeping your thoughts off of Twitter uh, and keeping them for this show. So I want to give you the floor uh, to say whatever you want to say or or to oh, begin man. the conversation on, on what we're dealing with right now. You want to go defensive-wise? Yeah. Fire everybody, fam. Like, I don't have a lot of deep takes. Yeah. Um, these, these guys should have been fired a couple of years ago. The extensions were egregious, even when C-Rob – no slight to see Rob, man. It's just like it's nothing personal. It's just I got a job to do. Everybody got a job to do. Nothing personal. But the performance wasn't there to, to extend him. Um, the only the, the only explanation for an extension with these guys is just relationships. Yeah. Um, the linebacker room has been has not been performing well. On um, the recruiting has been fine. So C Rob's a great recruiter, mm-hmm. but the development, uh, the play on the field just hasn't been there in that position. And there was a chance to upgrade that spot. Uh, I just think we use chance uh, opportunities to upgrade with staff or blowing that just on relationships. Even with the jewels thing, like we could have got T Rob, a more proven guy, a better recruiter. I think it's just so many opportunities. That's why I'm not even buying a new dude being hired because he's gonna go find somebody to fit mm-hmm. his mold, his culture. You know, like I don't really, I don't really trust the rest of this this, this regime right now. Be real, you start you start really limiting that list of potential candidates that'll say yes if you come in. And you say, hey, these are your four coaches on mm-hmm. that side of the ball, and they're not going anywhere. So figure out how to work with them. You you'll get the the best defensive coordinator options that would come to Florida. We'll tell we'll tell Demo no to his face, right? If 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 that's part of the stipulation of being hired. No, I'm not I'm not coming in and coaching with the dudes that got the guy whose job I'm taking fired. I'll bring mm-hmm. in my own people. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that to me is the biggest thing. Silk, you, you said it, and, and I wanted to talk about it too. I think that you just have to make wholesale changes. And now if you bring on a defensive coordinator that chooses to keep a, a David Turner or somebody else, perfect. Right. But I think that I you have Turner, to go but... into this season on – December 29th or whenever the Mayo Bowl is played that Florida's going to likely play in, that next day is you have to say, hey, grant them your contract's done. You know, don't let the door hit you where the good Lord splits you and you're out the door, right? But then if you go out and you hire somebody that you think is worth changing this defense around for, then you have to let everybody on the staff know, hey, this is now this person's responsibility. You can't keep your folks there in hopes that they can try to piecemeal it together. Cause then you're going to get stuck with somebody that either is unemployed and just looking for a job and will probably be gone in a year when Dan Mullen gets fired, or you have to go out and you have to pay big bucks, find the guy that you think can make the change and let that person have complete control of that defense and give it up completely. And I don't know the if cold, the, can the do culture, that. the culture is just, is, is just off, man. Um, I think as far as like uh, work ethic, the, the culture is there. Like, um, shout out to Savage. I do think these guys uh, work out right, nutrition, all that, the, 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 the basics, I don't think is bad. But uh, like I said, out of the spirit of competition, when that's not pure, it throws everything off, especially when you start losing, man. Um, these kids work hard. They work their whole lives to get to, to this stage, not to be held back. Like, that's just not – it's just not good. Like we all work, we go to work for a living. And if you got a boss that's that's on purpose holding you back, uh, you we all know that feeling. No, uh, this is not a good thing, man. So that's just bad culture, bro. And I don't know how you fix that. Uh, like we, well, we just spoke about all the sports being declining a little bit. So I think the University of Florida got got to look at stuff in the mirror a little bit and, and see what the standard is because everything's dropping a little bit. Yeah, no, I think that that's my biggest, you know, complaint now is, you know, I talked a lot about apathy, right? I talked about the way the fan base feels, the, the way that it feels like there's a tenor around the program is that it's apathy. There's not a lot of excitement. I don't hear Dan Mullen being very excited during his press conferences, win or lose. I don't see right. any desire in his voice to seemingly make changes when I see him on the sideline. It doesn't seem like he has the same intensity. And I'm not saying that you need to be this, like, raw, raw, super intense, yelling all the time type of coach to show intensity or to show passion or fervor, but I'm not, I'm not seeing that. And the guy that I saw when I worked for the University of Florida 15 years ago to what I saw when he was at Mississippi State to what I saw his first year, two, two and a half years here is very different than this Dan Mullen. And right. it's, it's, it's sad out, and man. disappointing because I thought it could work out. Yeah. He's dropping um, his name and coaching get... hats, man, and, and coaching rumors. He's checked out, bro. And we extended the guy that was all, like looking for other jobs and checked out a little bit. Yeah. And speaking of being checked out, we wanted to bring on a former uh, Mississippi State writer. Nick, why don't you go introduce Brett Hudson uh, to talk yeah. a little bit about his time at uh, – we're covering Dan Mullen. Well, uh, we're, we're trying to get into the, the full uh, psychoanalysis of Dan. We've talked about a lot of the reasons why he doesn't make a decision. Uh, Brett covered Dan uh, for the Clarion Ledger. Is that correct, Brett? It was the commercial dispatch. Uh, see, I'm, I'm, people in Starkville are going to be mad at me now. Uh, yeah. Um, they were mad at me when I said Starkville wasn't a great place to live and when, uh, the one time I went there. <laughs> so, you you and Dan like this I like disrespecting people's cities, man. <laughs> I, 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 I do. It, it, they don't like it. Uh, people, uh, I told people in Auburn, they didn't like Auburn either. They didn't like me. Uh, just keep it, keep it, keep it, keep it in the buck. Listen, it's just my opinion. Doesn't make it right. Doesn't make it wrong. Um, Brett, Brett is now uh, the chapter of member services coordinator for Phi Eta Sigma headquarters. Right, Brett? Yep. Yep, uh, a national honor society. Very ironic that they let a sports writer work for an honor yeah. society, but uh, the checks are clear. So, what? <laughs> yes. uh, maybe they're they're just laundering money now, Brett. We won't, we won't get you in trouble here, though. Right. Um, but I, I met Brett uh, at covering baseball, um, and and when Dan was hired, uh, I think he he chuckled, and it didn't seem like. The people in Starkville uh, were too mad that Dan Mullen was leaving. He maybe had worn out his welcome. Um, and then uh, it had been a couple of months. So media day happens in July. So Mullen gets hired December, December-ish, uh, or November, November, December-ish. Um, 
And Brett was like, I, I see him in Atlanta that year, SEC media days. And he goes, hey, where's Dan been? And I'm like, oh, I'm sure, I'm sure Dan's been recruiting. Like he, he had to, a quick turnaround just one month before the early signing period. And, and then you've got the, the secondary signing period. So he's definitely been recruiting. And Brett's like, well, do you know where he's been? I'm like, no, not really. He goes, this is vacation time. Dan and the staff are not recruiting. They're enjoying the large amounts of money that universities give them to play football. And he's like, he's not going to recruit. And I'm like, well, no, no one can recruit at Mississippi State. It's, it's going to be different now that he's at Florida. And Brett's just kind of like, okay, all right. And now, now that I'm probably saying this, I think, publicly for the first time, Florida fans are the Leonardo DiCaprio gif, just like pointing at pointing at their phone right now, going, yeah, yeah, no, Brett was right. He doesn't recruit. He doesn't do anything. Um, but, Brett, we wanted to bring you on just to kind of see. Uh, I read some stories about a quarterback decision uh, with Dak Prescott, and I forget who it was uh, starting at, him at, the, at the time. And – and I think that we're living in a simulation. And it feels like, are we just, are we, are we getting the same coach in, in, in the press conferences and in the decisions? Are we getting the same coach that you covered when, when Dan was there in, in 2013? Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much the, the <laughs> same dude. All well, the way thanks, Brett. We'll have you on another time. <laughs> all right, all right. Thanks, thanks um, man. <laughs> but now, I mean, I, I do want to dive into the recruiting thing a little bit because it wasn't that Dan was a bad recruiter. At Mississippi State, he just wasn't the transcendent recruiter. And, and people just kind of made that logical leap, right, where they just assume that if you have rosters that good at Mississippi State, you take the platform that's provided to you by Florida with the very obvious wealth of in-state talent, you assume the ceiling is going to rise, the floor is going to rise, and it might mess around and end up with a national championship somewhere in there. And that's not necessarily a bad logical leap to make, but – it's kind of assuming that there is no in-state talent in Mississippi, which is not true. Mm -hmm. There is there is a good bit of talent in, in Mississippi, but the, the problem that Dan ran into, which is kind of why the program kind of got stuck in the mud after that big transcendent season in 2014, where they were number one in the first college football playoff rankings for like a month or so until they ran into Alabama, ended up going 10-3 and three and going to the Orange Bowl that year. But after that, they went nine and four, six and seven, eight and four before Dan left for the the Florida job. Ended his career at Mississippi State with with sixty nine wins. I'll, I'll leave that where it is and let people do with it what they will. Nice. But um, <laughs> look, well, it was, it was a lateral move if you follow Dan's own uh, own judgment. And when Jeff Collins left, it was a lateral move for him to come to Florida. Another another interesting aspect of Dan Bowen his uh, his public speaking engagements, but. <laughs> um, where, where Dan didn't quite hit the mark was capitalizing on that momentum, was capitalizing on that momentum and taking the recruiting brand from an in-state one to a regional one, to a national one. I was looking this up before uh, I came on. In the recruiting classes of 2014 through 2017, and, and all of these numbers are, are rivals, by the way, obviously, um, in, those, in those recruiting classes, Mississippi State signed 17 four- and five-star recruits. Only five of them were from outside of Mississippi. Now, Joe Moorhead comes in, a Yankee, right? A dude who went to college in New York, who came from Penn State, has little to no recruiting ties in the Southeast. He immediately comes in in the transition class and gets two top talents from New Orleans. One of them is the linebacker, Aaron Brule, who was just outside of the top 10 in the SEC and tackles for a loss last year. Then he adds a four-star QB from Charlotte, Garrett Schrader, who played a little bit for Joe and is now the starting QB at Syracuse. And then he did most of the work on a running back from Atlanta named Joquavius Marks, who led last year's Mississippi State team in rushing and currently leads this year's running backs in receptions and receiving yards, which is a big deal since this is an air raid offense, right? You take all of that into account, and Joe Moorhead accomplished about as much in – top line out of state recruiting in about a year and a half that Dan Mullen did in an entire four year recruiting cycle. Well, that, Dan that, Mullen's out Dan Mullen's not recruiting at that level currently that he was recruiting at, at Mississippi State. Exactly. So I, I think that's where the the disconnect kind of comes in that basic ideology of take what you did at Mississippi State, add the obvious resources of Florida, and you get something excellent. And the, that out of state recruiting aspect of it is key because I don't have to tell any of y'all this, but everybody recruits Florida. 
that, yes, there is a ton of talent in Florida. There's also a lot of people coming in to steal that talent. There is a lot of talent in Florida, but there is not so much talent that everyone recruiting Florida can be happy. There is not so much talent that the big three in Florida plus Bama and Georgia and Clemson and Tennessee and North and South Carolina and all those schools can be happy. You have to go out of the state to finish the job and make the roster the way you want it to be, like they did with a quarterback from Texas named Kyle Trask, like they did with a wideout from Alabama named Kadarius Toney and another Alabama guy named LaMichael Ryan, like they did with a tight end from Philly named Kyle Pitts. These names are probably sounding familiar to you, right? <laughs> like, th that's what you have to do to go from good to great, as as Dan Mullen will, will say on occasion. And um, the, the track record of doing that just isn't there with him, which is why I was kind of critical of the recruiting side of things when he got the job at Florida. What do you think it is? Because still, still close to podcast, uh, Big Three Roll-Up. It's, it's Miami, Florida State, Florida. Um, and and he, was, he was laughing at his co-hosts. Yeah, Florida, Florida was supposed to be a New Year's Six team. Um, they're ready to fire Manny Diaz down in Miami. Uh, Silk's got more jokes than he's even told yet. He's still got some, you know, it loaded up on on, on Mike Norvell. Um, I still got some. I'm not out. Uh, no, you, you're not out, but I'm down. But I'm not. I'm not. I'm down. But I'm not jokes. FSU of Miami. You know what I'm saying? You were looking down at them, and now you guys are all seeing eye to eye, unranked no, in the no, AP. No, no, why, relax. why is why can't relax? I'm, this is why I'm not on that show. This, this is yeah, gotta, why, can't Dan, why can't Dan see that? Why can't Dan see? Hey, okay, I have to compete against Dabo and 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 probably Lane Kiffin to to some extent and Nick Saban, four guys in my state. But I shouldn't have to be competing against Miami and against Florida State. And if you look at these rankings, they're recruiting better than Florida. I don't. I just don't think that recruiting is his cup of tea. Like you, you see coaches around the SEC like like Nick Saban and Kirby Smart where I mean just based on their mannerisms and and the their actions you would think recruiting to them is just as important or just as fun for them to do as setting up a game plan is as managing he just thinks he's smarter than everything he thinks he's smarter than recruiting he thinks he's smarter than playing the best players and seniority he thinks he's smarter than just everything it's just not working out that way all of this is true, and, and I think a lot of that is rooted in the Dan Mullen system. What it accomplishes better than anything else is getting the best out of, for lack of a better phrase, flawed parts. Like, hmm. he is the person who can take the wide receiver that everybody else thought was too slow or take the running back that, that everybody else thought wouldn't translate to the college level and find the things in them that work and make them work. And the best example of that was Nick Fitzgerald. His last quarterback at Mississippi State, triple option guy that nobody else offered. There was that very famous quote uh, after UT an end Chattanooga. UT Chattanooga, even though it was actually UT Martin. He got that fact <laughs> wrong in the press conference. I don't know why Florida fans would need to know that right now. That's neither here nor there. He, he, do, he just does that, Nick, right? Man. He does that. He does that. And when you take that ideology into all other aspects of what you're doing, running the organization. You can see where that kind of ideology goes into it and says, I don't have to go spend all of my time texting and calling everyone associated with that five-star recruit that everybody wants me to get. Cause I can go get some low four-star high three-star and get the results. And in some cases that is true. They did come within six points of possibly the greatest college football team of all time in the SEC championship game like 10 months ago. But you're not looking for that one game close loss. You're looking for sustained success. You're looking for national championships with an S, plural, because Urban Meyer showed it can be done. And I don't yeah. know that it can be done recruiting this way. I just don't know that it can. Yeah, scheming close losses to Bama ain't fun no more. <laughs> <laughs> um. What about something that we keep seeing with Dan Mullen teams? And he can X and O, I think probably as well, game plan as well as anybody. You saw that, you know, uh, Florida, the score doesn't look as close as the game really was in 2019 at Baton Rouge. Um, gave, gave that team, an undefeated national champion, a great game. Last year gave Alabama a great game. This year, again with Alabama. But the losses to teams that you should never lose to. He lost to Kentucky in his first year. Lost to Missouri, a bad Missouri team in his first year. Lost to Kentucky again. 
does does and now we're sitting here as as fans and reporters saying they play up to and down to their level of competition. Is that something that happened in, in Starkville as well? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that that was something that, that drove Mississippi State fans crazy. Like they to take that transcendent season from 2014, they beat Texas A&M and Auburn in back-to-back weeks to catapult themselves up to, to number one. They go from number 12 to number one in two weeks because of the quality of competition they they beat in those in those games. And they beat Auburn by 15 that year. That wasn't like a nail-biter that they were lucky to come away with. That was the game day game, and, and they just ran it. And then later that year, they lose the Egg Bowl. What? You're number one in the nation for a month? and you manage to lose the Egg Bowl, and then you lose to Georgia Tech in the Orange Bowl, which you can play the lazy, didn't care about this bowl card if you want to on that. I personally would disagree, neither here nor there. How do you lose the Egg Bowl with with that team, with the dude who is entering, what, like year five or six as the starting quarterback for the Dallas Cowboys on your roster? Like, how do you lose that Egg Bowl? And that wasn't an awful Ole Miss team. I mean, that that was a Hugh Freeze Ole Miss team. They were top 25 for most or all of the year. Yeah, actually all of it. Um, but that's still a game that you should probably win with, with that kind of Mississippi State roster. And then they go to, to Vaught Hemingway and they lose it 31 to 17. I mean, I, he would do that in many of, of his seasons. And, and they would go through stretches where they were just non-competitive. Like the, the one stretch that comes to mind from the, the most recent Mississippi State Dan Mullen team that I covered, obviously the 2017 one, was it, they ended September in back-to-back road games against Georgia and against Auburn. They lost those games 31 to three and 49 to 10. Uh, mm-hmm. Somebody m- more intelligent than I can can do the math on the combined score there, but th- they were clearly non-competitive games, and, and and they got right after that. They they had a pretty solid win at Texas A&M. That year, they won a weird game against Arkansas. They almost beat Alabama. There was a, a Todd Grantham special in, in that game that may or may not have prevented them from beating Alabama that day. But then what they do that year, they lost the Egg Bowl again. They, 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 that's what these Dan Mullen teams did. They would they were up and down in, in ways that were perplexing. Like, how does the same team beat LSU 37-7 beat Texas A&M on the road 35-14, to 14, rush for about a billion yards in that game, and then lose the Egg Bowl at home. That That's the Dan Mullen experience, right? No. I, I'm sitting here, and most people will listen to this, you know, uh, wherever they listen to podcasts, but we've got some people watching on YouTube um, tomorrow whenever they're watching, and I think they're watching Dan's face go from, man, I thought I was watching this brand new TV show to realizing like, oh no, this show this is just a rerun <laughs> of, of a previous show that's been on TV for a decade and you yeah. just didn't know about this show before. <laughs> I'm watching Dan come to the same realization writers. of like, oh my God, this uh, is, I went from watching The Office to Parks and Rec. Same writers, very similar premises, <laughs> just different sets. Yeah. It's, it's the Dan Mullen spinoff is what it is. <laughs> It's, it's like the Big Bang Theory and Young Sheldon. It's it's just it's the same it's the same characters. It's the same concept, just done in a slightly different. So so I'm okay. the one that's wrong by thinking that it, it could have been different. That's on me. I'll get a it, fix. I mean, it could have oh, been. I, 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 I just saw I just saw the hope drain from your face as, as the more Brett was talking. You're like, no, that's. I'm just listening. I'm just shaking my head. I'm just like, geez, Louise, everything he's saying is right. That's the thing. It could have been different. Like it, it could have been if. If Dan Mullen had changed some of his ideologies on the recruiting side, if he had made some coaching staff changes that have frankly been kind of overdue, but he'll probably never make uh, unless he's forced to. If he had done some of those things, if he had changed his Mississippi State approach to a job that is quite different from Mississippi State, then yeah, it could have been different. But I mean, y'all are living it every day. Are y'all yeah. seeing anything that is at all different? from what you saw at Mississippi State and how he approached the two jobs. Is there any difference? Covering the same guy you you covered, Brett. Covering the same guy you covered. All the Um, way up to the cringeworthy moments in the press conferences. All the way up to it. It's beyond cringe, man. It's like, it's getting a little weird. He, um, I don't know, he definitely doesn't have like a PR person 
I don't know. Oh what, no! <laughs> I don't know what I would have to. I don't know what they, if he was like. If he was like Nick, can you help me out in my press conferences? I'm like, listen, man, we our our salaries <laughs> starting in the six figures, and it's not low six figures because you are a disaster, <laughs> and we got a lot of work to do. And I don't think you're going to listen to me when I tell you things you need to say and things you don't need to say. Um, but I wanted to ask, and, and what, where we're at now, uh, you mentioned Todd Grantham um, and, and the coaching changes. Um, I think Dan is going to be given an easy out because Ty Grantham's contract is up this year. Um, I've been trying to figure out, you know, when coaches' contracts are up, normally they've agreed to something new. Um, but I think he's going to get an easy out and not uh, just not renew Todd's contract. Won't have to fire him. Um, but then when you start looking at guys, I mean, I said it when we were just talking to Shannon Snell. He, he and he and John Hevesy have been together for over 20 years. Yeah. Um Going back to Bowling Green when they're both assistants, um, he that's his that's his that's his dog. <laughs> Hevesy is going to be on a coach uh, on a Dan Mullen head coaching head coach football team as long as John Hevesy is alive and, and wanting to coach football. Um, he only made one coaching change, fired one coach in his decade near decade at Mississippi State. What do you think it is? Is it just blind loyalty? What is it that Dan? won't make changes even when you've got a fan base and, and people watching that look and say it, it's so clear it's so obvious loyalty definitely plays a a, a big part of it I, I also think that everyone has their idiosyncrasies everybody has their their personality traits and their characteristics that are a little weird and different and uh when when dan has has found people who are okay with and, and and able to kind of roll with the punches with with his he's he's gonna keep them and and i mean look mississippi state fans were were beating the the anti john hevesy drum for a good four or five years before the end of dan mullen's time here which now that i say that out loud i realize is basically half of his tenure and and starful um they were they were beating that drum for for a minute um and and it just was never on the table for for him. It was never going to to come to pass, despite all of the crucial misses in offensive line recruiting, despite mm -hmm. all of the cases where development just wasn't there in a big time prospect that they they did cite. Um, despite all of those instances, a a change there just just was not on the table. And I don't want to come after the guy hard for that because loyalty is an admirable quality in, in human beings. Right. And uh, I, I guess I can leave that to Mississippi state fans and now Florida fans. If, if they want to bash that for their own reasons, that's perfectly fine. I'm not going to stop them from it, but I, I think both of those things are, are at play there. That's, wow. that's just one of those things when, when you have a coach, when, when you have someone like this in a, in a public position where you're kind of leaning on on that person and and everything he is you know what his character traits are and you know what they're not like you know like if you're an Ole Miss fan right now you know you're gonna go for it on fourth down probably eight or so times in, in every game whether you like it or whether you don't you know that's what you're gonna get and you just have to be along for the ride whether you like it or not same deal with Dan. Like you're you're gonna have John Hevesy as your offensive line coach. You can love it, you can hate it, you can be somewhere in between. You just have to accept the good with the bad and in that regard. And I'll I'll let each individual decide whether Hevesy's presence is a good or a bad. Hmm. They've decided. They, they, oh, I bet they, they have. Did. It has been decided. The, the people that write have. the checks have decided. I bet they have. And, and hey, by the way, did y'all notice that the uh the dude who was his interim for the bowl game after he left for for Florida, his, his name was Greg Knox. Where's Greg Knox nowadays? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was that was the the craziest. People were like, "Who's going to coach running backs?" Nick and I'm like, "Listen, uh, I know Florida doesn't have a bowl game, so you're not really focused on that." I was like, "But you can tune into uh, the bowl game and you'll see Florida's next running back coach." Like that was the the worst kept secret. Yep. Listen, yeah. Dan gives these guys. They had Jawan Sider on staff, and I told him to kick around. Had Jawan yeah. Sider on staff. Oh, they're like, no, Knox has been here for a decade. That's a, that's right, now, been, so. right now, we could have Jawan Sider and T Rob on this staff, like just getting studs across the country. Like, even if you, you just got to be, you, you're so smart, but you got to be smart enough to know, like, let me get guys around me that are good at what I'm not good at. Let me get recruiters around me. I think it goes back to what Brett said. It's, it's, We've done it so many times. We've gotten that kid nobody cared about, the kid that couldn't play. 
it might take three, four years for that, that offensive lineman to put on the 60 pounds he needs to put on, but I'm going to make or it. I'll make him an all SEC red shirt senior or yeah. lose. Yeah. They're getting, we're getting some big boys down here. At Gainesville, Brett, getting some real big boys, some 400 pounders. Um, I'm fine with that. Do it. Big, where, where, where are we going next, Brett? We're only in year four. Well, you should uh, be. We're, we're only, we're only in season four of this sitcom, Brett. We're, what, what what lies next for Gator fans? For seasons five, six, and seven. <laughs> More of the same, I Can't guess. Wait. Like like frustratingly close to Alabama and Georgia. Very rarely better, right? Mm. Like I mean, that's what the Mississippi State tenure was. Like like they were close to to being that that number two team in the SEC that could very clearly challenge for for the title, but it, it never fully came to pass. And I think that's going to be a little bit easier to sustain at Florida for, for very obvious reasons. All the reasons that you take the Florida job over the, the Mississippi state job, all the, all the reasons that you don't make yourself look like a moron and call it a lateral move. When someone leaves Mississippi state for Florida, Um, all of those reasons will make it easier to sustain a certain level of, of excellence and success that will probably make the cocktail party, um, the de facto SEC East championship game for quite a while, especially since Tennessee doesn't look like it's ever going to get its act together. Um, that'll probably be the case for, for quite a while. Like is, but is Florida going to put itself in a position where they can win the cocktail party three out of five years? Are they going to put themselves in a position where in those three SEC championship game appearances, they win one of them? Are they going to put themselves in that position where that one team that breaks through to the playoff maybe gets to the national championship game? I'm very skeptical of that. And I, I, that skepticism is not based in just hot takery. It is based in the the very long track record of, of Dan Mullen that, that we have from his time at, at Mississippi State. Hmm. Neat. I, I'm sorry I'm so depressing. Oh no, I, no, I, no, man. I don't, no, I don't want to. I don't want to like bash Dan for another hour. We, we've been like two hours. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I promise I'm a good hang, but no. like, <laughs> oh, here's, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Y'all have a good football coach. Mm-hmm. Period. He's good. That's what's going You have That's a good football thing. coach. I, I think he's checked he's out problem. a little bit. Here's the problem. There are great ones in Tuscaloosa. There are great mm-hmm. ones in Athens and Columbus, Ohio, and uh, possibly in Austin, Texas. We'll see. Maybe USC gets a great one. Like, that's the problem. That's the problem. You have a good football coach when you're looking for a great one. Well, Brett. Um, <laughs> Brett, you've thoroughly depressed Dan tonight. You got Brett, some, you got no, some no. Uh, yeah, yeah. I know. No, I'm not good. You got some, you got some triggering stuff you want to warn us about? No? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, next show, next show. Don't worry about yeah, next no show. We'll get you back on the, uh, to the to we have questions for Scott Strickland show. That may, may be yeah. in a week or so. That may be next Monday. Stay tuned. Um, Brett, we know you don't write anymore, uh, or at least for uh, publication, uh, but let everybody know where they can follow you on uh, on Twitter or social media if you're still. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm still, I'm still nonsensical on Twitter. That's at Brett underscore Hudson. But uh, honestly, I'm hoping my my next gig is the head coach at Washington State because they are wide open right now, baby. Yeah, they I'm are. Throwing my name in that yeah. ring. Because yeah. you know what, y'all, I'm fully vaccinated. That's mm-hmm. apparently the only requirement. I am ready to go. Fifteen That's million dollars. Go Cougs, baby. Go Cougs. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be right. in Pullman in the morning if I gotta be. Oh, man. Listen, I, think, you know, I, do. I don't think, yeah, I think you might want to rethink that. I'll be in Poland in the morning for 15 mil. I got yeah. two kids, y'all. He's got it. He's got yeah. 15 mil. You, you, know how, you know how much, you know how many bad plays you can call to get fired without cause? And then you and get then all I 15 can live of that, that million? buyout life. Mm. Are you Ooh, kidding that's me? That's life, baby. That's, that's, the best, life. that's the best gig in America. Like, you live like AO a little bit? You want to live like AO? Ed, Ed Ogeron might be one of the smartest men in America. Yeah, he's in life, man. You know? <laughs> That's what I'm saying, man. Like, Some of these reports that are coming out, Ed O might burn through that $17 million. I don't know how oh, much. I, I can, I can see might, that. He's having a great time. Oh, he's going to have an man, awesome time. Best life. Ed Orgeron, awesome time. I have no doubt in my mind. There's, you know, there's those times every once in a while they go viral when somebody's like interviewing somebody right about the Powerball. And they're like, what are you going to buy if you win? And they're like strippers and cocaine. Like I can actually see Ed Orgeron <laughs> doing that, you know? Uh, like a, no, no. A, a, an airboat the size of a yacht. I can see it. You're like Kenny Powers. <laughs> yeah. 
And just that's as how, that's how, how, that's how I envision uh, Ed, Ed Orger, Orgeron's life, uh, like Kenny he's, Powers. He probably got he's Cajun Steve Kenny Powers. Orgeron. I like that. I like that. Exactly. Cajun Kenny Powers. Exactly. Awesome. All right, Brett. We, uh, Brett, we appreciate it. We, we got a uh, uh, fire Ty Grantham on the on the rest of the podcast. Uh, yeah, 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 exactly. Y'all, uh, yeah. y'all enjoy that. Thanks for uh, having me. We appreciate you. Brett. All right. Let me give a quick shout out to our friends over at Prize Picks. Use promo code SG, get a dollar for dollar match uh, all the way up to $100 uh, when you do live uh, daily wagering and uh, fantasy on prizepicks.com. Promo code SG. Um, I know that, that Brett uh, kind of echoed a lot of the things that we talked about. Um, Silk, anything else you want to get off your chest? I got one other comment. Uh, but Silk, anything else you want to get off Getting your chest? Getting your bag. I see. I'm, 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 let me shuffle through mine a little bit. Yeah. I, so, I know I forgot. I, something, I suppose, something else I'm supposed to be mad at. So, to so I wanted. To, I said this to Nick um, right before we started, is that I, I want to um, – I want to run through not just firing, but I want to run through the risk, right? So not taking this position, just kind of announcing what the, what this other position is, is that there's a very, very, it, it is very hard to hire. It is very hard to bring people into an environment, um, even if you think you know them really well. So Scott Strickland, obviously had worked with Dan Mullen for a long, long time at Mississippi State. And Obviously, there was a comfort factor there, even so much that Scott Strickland wanted to find somebody else because he was afraid of going and poaching his old school is how comfortable he felt with Dan Mullen. I think things have changed, and I think the variables have changed, which is why I don't think that this is working out the way that everybody has envisioned. But I do want to say this, that calling for firing people, the responding hire isn't always necessarily better, even if the variables are better. So that's my that's my only caution is as somebody that works very, very closely with hiring and very, very close with executive search, very, very close to finding people in environments that are as high stakes as this Florida program is, it can be very challenging to make that hire. Um, and, and that's my only caution is that with Dan Mullen, you know what you're getting. And I'm not saying that that's a good thing or a bad thing. You just know, right? We heard Brett basically echo the exact same thing that, that we're dealing with here at Florida. But I will say, just in my experience and knowing that there's always a greener pasture, there's always a better view out there, that it, it can be very, very, very challenging it's business to get that higher right. So as we're calling for people to be removed from positions to hire somebody else, to know that that is a very, very challenging thing to do. And Scott Strickland is a human. Athletic directors are human. They're making decisions on both fact and instinct. And just because you make a decision doesn't necessarily mean the answer is better. Uh, so that would be my only caution as um, somebody that kind of has my, the, the worldview that I have. So. Word up. Speechless. Speechless. No, no and man, again, that's um, not that's not a take that I'm, I'm I'm making as I don't think that that should stop decisions. I'm just saying that that's something to always remember and keep in the back of your mind. No, for sure. But I, I just want somebody that's just like has passion for the University mm -hmm. of Florida, man. Um, it's a risk. It's hard to find good coaches. Texas is still looking for a good coach. Uh, Miami has been looking for a good coach for for, for uh, forever. We we've already mm -hmm. seen how hard it is for us to find good coaches. Uh, Florida State has its debacle. Tennessee's been looking for forever. USC has been looking for forever. You know, like, yep. it's hard to find good coaches. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's hard to just live complacent and, and just sit here and just, like, it's just not getting any better. Um, just don't feel right. And the guys, like, Dan Mullen clearly is looking for a new job every offseason. So mm -hmm. if he looking, we need to be looking. It's like recruiting, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, yep. It's tough because you, you go from Spur to Zook and you give Zook, what, four years? Um, mm -hmm. And then you hit the reset button. And, and, and like Dan said, hiring's tough. So you, you get Mullen and now – or not Mullen, you get Muschamp. Uh, maybe, maybe, whoops, maybe word vomit there. Maybe uh, just uh, what we're looking at. Um, you get Muschamp and then he gets four years, fired in his fifth, and, and you're hitting the reset button again. And I guess then the, the decision – 
that Scott Strickland has to make is, are we at a point where we need to hit the reset button? Mm-hmm. Or can Dan get us to where I think he can? I think Scott Strickland still thinks Dan Mullen is a national championship coach at the University of Florida. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I truly believe that Scott Strickland thinks that still to this day as we take this, as I as the words are coming out of my mouth. Um, and I don't think Florida will reset and, and fire Dan Mullen after this year. I think it would take a Jim McElwain-esque death threat um, – <laughs> death threat it's like i don't think it's do. completely implausible i don't think that there's death threats but i Listen, would not be surprised if there's like some pr like dan dan is liable to put his foot in his mouth anytime there's public speaking involved uh i think he showed that all 2020 um i, I mean i'm i miss the guy that that wanted to thumb wrestle i missed mm-hmm. that i thought that was a great a great response to losing to missouri um and then now when you lose games it's we'll evaluate We'll figure mm-hmm. it out. We'll fix it. Um, I just don't Checked see that fire anymore. Yeah, I thought I thought Checked he took. Out, account- bro. I thought I thought he took some more accountability. Um, uh, I, th- I can't remember if it was after it was it wasn't after Kentucky. I thought he took accountability for some of the mistakes at Vanderbilt, the Vanderbilt game. Um, but then you know, I just don't see him taking accountability enough. Um, he seemed more angry about only being up twenty one points against Vanderbilt at halftime than he did yes. after the Florida lost to LSU. Yeah. I told you I wasn't buying it last week, overcompensating a little bit. I just wasn't buying it, fam. Mm. So the show goes on. The, the ball is ultimately in Scott Strickland's court. I mean, we've, we've used the, the corporate example all show, or I have. Um, Scott Strickland is your the president or the chairman of your board of directors. If yep. he wants to make a decision, he's got to make it. And, you know, now the question is, and I know what the Twitter – their timeline. Uh, so this is more of a rhetorical question is, do you think that Scott Strickland's that guy that can make those decisions and make those choices? And do you think that Scott Strickland is going to put the University of Florida in the best position to leave uh, a good football program moving forward? Does Florida fall into the to the the status of a, a Stanford or a Michigan? Um, you know, uh, I, probably another school or two that I'm missing. Uh, a Texas, that's a, a fantastic academic institution that just can't seem uh, to get over the football hump. Um, and you're content with eight, nine, ten, you know, eleven wins. I, I know that I'm not, but I'm also not the athletic director. So um, I will say this um, <clears throat> from talking to some people, I don't. I think Scott Strickland's got to figure some stuff out as well. Um, and I have a good relationship with him. I really like Scott. Um, what you're dealing with, I mean, football was on probation. Uh, the women's basketball is a national disgrace, and the way you've mm-hmm. handled it was a, was a, became a national disgrace. Um, the women's basketball team, even before that, wasn't winning. Uh, was the men's basketball team, yeah. the men's basketball team isn't winning, um, but at least Mike White is a good person, um, mm-hmm. and and you know not throwing basketballs at his players. Um, the hires that have, that you've made have not panned out, and, and if they're not panning out and bringing in negative light to the university, mm-hmm. which is now touting being a top five university, public university in the country, um, you might have to end up making some tough decisions. I think I think right now, you know, the board of trustees and and President Fox is probably fine with the basketball program. You know, they're they're making the tournament, um, mm-hmm. and they're not they're not making waves, bad waves. Um, I, I think you've got to, if you're Scott and if, if football ends, what, let's say eight and four, if you no show a bowl game, like, like you did last year, you're eight and five. Um, you've got to make some, you're, you got, you have to have a conversation with Dan Mullen. Like, Hey, you changes are being made. Mm-hmm. Either we're going to give you $12 million and find a new football coach, which I don't think Scott Shirley wants to do, or you're making changes to your staff. Because what what we're what we're doing now is what Dan talked about earlier. Happy football fans, they're gonna buy tickets, buy merchandise, um, join the Gator Collective. They're gonna they're gonna do things to benefit the program. Angry football fans, they'll still do that. They'll they'll still donate. They'll still buy their seats because they're they're if they're angry, that means they're still engaged. Once you reach the the point where it's apathy, where where you have an apathetic fan base. That's when people start selling that stock, what you were just saying, Dan. That's when they start selling their shares. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't mean that in the sense of selling and giving money to the university. They, they check out. And once you mm-hmm. get that in a fan base, that's when, uh, you know, uh, if we're using a Fortune 500 company as, you know, uh, 
as an example. That's when Pepsi changes CEOs. Mm -hmm. His fan base CEO, don't. His fan base don't uh, uh, check out. They just uh, right. They just go in. Um, they just, I mean, they don't go they, in harder. They taking shifts on Twitter, fam. Um, shout out <laughs> to my man Taz. He's running. He's a supervisor, but they running shifts, man. It's like nonstop, like banter. So I think even if they check out of like uh, like attending games, I think the pressure is just gonna build. Right. Um, yeah, it's gonna be regardless. vocal. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. this, this this fan base ain't gonna just check out and just vibe and chill and wait for it to get good again. No, it's gonna get real loud in the system. At mm -hmm. times, at times, I've said I think it's the vocal or the vocal minority is being loud. Do you think that is shifting now? Do you think more people are mm -hmm. jumping on? Because I asked it during the game, and of course, he lost the fan base. Fan. I think fan base is gone. He got two you think gone or going? Gone so or going? I, I don't think they're gone. I think they're going right. I think that you you are the farthest gone you've been under Dan Mullen, and that's how we're yeah, going. Sure. Dan yeah. got to go do something like Willie. He got to do something right now. I think I think <laughs> I don't do see it, man. Um, I think the fans are just like annoyed about his arrogance. It ain't, it ain't just the losses. So I, I think they're going like that's just my opinion. I could be wrong. Yeah, no, no I, I would agree. I mean, I was at a, a Gator bar on Saturday, and I mean, there was a very palpable um, frustration more than anything. It's, it's worse than Biden, bro. It's like, right. Well, I mean, I, I think people are frustrated because you know that they can be better, and they do what Brett said, right? They lay an egg. Right. They they can't get over the hump. They can't get out of their own way, and. Todd Grantham was already a very shaky hire even before he came here. He padded his stats that one season against really crappy teams, right? But outside of that, Florida has not done well against teams that have great talent defensively, even if we've won the game. They've not done great against, you know, good talent. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that people are annoyed by Dan Mullen. I think that people think that he's like a very odd character, right? And you can be odd when you're winning, but when you're odd and you're just like, who is this guy? Right. And then all of the other things that go into it, right? Like this, it, it Yo, can be embarrassing. Anybody ever says, who is this guy? It's never a good thing. Yeah. I mean, it's but like but, you really want to meet the person and like, who is this guy? Like, yeah. who, what, that, what those is, words, it's just never good. Because you think of Dan Mullen, you think of Tim Tebow, Percy Harvin, uh, you know, the, all of those Gators from, you know, 06 to 09. Urban made and those think, decisions, bro. Of, of Kyle Trask. And then you think of Kyle Pitts and Kadarius Tony and all these other guys. And you're like, wait a second. Those were Urban's guys. And then those were Jim McElwain's guys. And yes, he made them better. Maybe Kyle Trask, you can throw under him. But all of a sudden, all of this luster wears away and you just get frustrated. And I think that that's where the fan base is. And I don't think it's a, a vocal minority. I still think he him. got guys on offense. He's just shoving them. Uh, when AR got in the game, man, everybody just started looking better. I forgot. I was like, who is two? Oh, that is Gamble. <laughs> you know, yeah. like... Everybody just start looking better. And he's a, like Anthony Richardson is a guy that elevates people's play, man. He needs to be on the field. And I think like we start seeing a more creative offense. Like just mm -hmm. hands down. Like them saying that whoever had was saying this kid ain't know the offense. Bro, we seen more stuff and more exotic plays than we seen all season this this LSU game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I was a guy, you know, and I retract myself and I apologize, my public apology, that I didn't think that Anthony Richardson, you know, should be playing more just because of the struggles against Vanderbilt, you know, the interception early in the game. But, you know, you do see it, you know, the tune change. You saw it against, you know, USF. You saw it against, you know, uh, LSU here that when he came in and you gave him a little bit of time that, you know, he was able to fire on all cylinders. And those players that you wonder where they are are all of a sudden there. And he does – elevate to a point where you are now forced to play him and the fact that you're forced to play him like even has like more question marks see, about even, why were you doing it before right see even the vandy games and like uh people say oh now we're in sec play like vandy's better than fau or, or, or usf i think the play calling changed bro. Mm -hmm. like i think he wasn't just shoving him on the bench i think he was calling terrible plays uh, until we really needed him and Dan got in his bag. But I, I don't fault him for those those games where he came in. I just felt like they were calling bad plays for him. I never well, felt like he didn't deserve the reps. I just thought, like, been, what, what, what are these calls? It's been established that the third drive is Anthony Richardson. So the first drive you have, you go – did they go three and out? I think I think they went three and out to start the game. That's so lame. 
Um, then, then you get a touchdown drive. You get a touchdown drive from Emory Jones. I'm thinking, all right, good. Anthony's gonna come in for the third. Three, three straight handoffs. Like, yo, you could have called me down from the press box. I could have said, said, hut. I could have done your clap count, and I could have handed those three balls off. Like, what are you doing? You just had some momentum. Um, I think I, I don't know if it was on that drive, that third drive. You might have been like LSU, where they were, probably looking for reasons to quit in that game. Looking yes. for a reason to quit. Go up, go up 14 0, three, you know, three drives in with two different quarterbacks. All right, thank you. You've given us our reason. Let's just let's get a running clock going. Um, instead, you basically punt on that drive by handing it off three times. I think uh, it was also third and eight, too. You hand, hand that ball off. Man, we um, jumped up 6 0. And we wasted great field position because they—I don't know what their punter was on, but he was—he was just not kicking good. That's we wasted fun. two possessions of great field position, and I mean later in the game we found out that we had a weapon on the side sideline that would have put this game away. Like, and you just put a team out of their misery. If they hanging around, hanging around, the players out in the park, the fans out in the parking lot. I was like, well, "What? Why, it's still close. <laughs> Let's go inside." You know. Yeah. And then next thing you know, it's a crowd. Everybody's into it. Now it's the thing. Um, and everything just snowballed from there. Well, I think I'm starting away. to see. I've I've I've, I've started this. I've started to see. I've seen some fans, and I, I didn't really buy into it. Say that he doesn't have that killer instinct. He doesn't <laughs> step on a team's neck when he has the chance to. Um, you know, dig that heel in. No, we can't um, wait I'm for start- an opportunity to blow an opportunity. I'm I'm seeing I'm seeing it now. Like he didn't start getting into his bag, calling plays until they were down late in the game. When right. Anthony came in, like everything before that was like vanilla. He ran a, a double, <coughs> he ran a play act, a fake play act or a fake zone read sweep to Jacob Copeland. Like, where was that in the first quarter or in the second quarter? He ran, they ran a, like a, a good double play action on a play. I'm looking like, all right, Dan Mullen's cooking now. Well, you're down 14, but now you're starting to cook. Hmm. Things that make you go, hmm. Hmm. It um, uh, I, I I don't know. I, I don't. I'm defeated it. after listening to Brett. I'm just um, the <laughs> winner's taking out all my yeah, yeah, I don't know. Y'all brought Brett on here to beat the dead horse, man. That was crazy. I think I think Brett, it was Brett, valuable. Brett. I think it was valuable because we're sitting here when, when, when we got good. Dan Mullen. I think all three of us said that's a home run hire. Look what he did at Mississippi State. He's no, out in the desert. He's out in the desert. <laughs> that sounds he, like, oh, no, you actually did. I said what's happening now first. Like, that's what I said at first. And then, you know, I'm a fan, so I'm, I'm going to root for whoever is coaching here. But when he first got hired or before he got I said all the things we, we, we're going through right now. I won't remind everybody who so did want to hire, but. I want to hire him. Chip Kelly. I want to hire, uh, uh, what's my man's name? Scott Frost. Um, all these guys are bums right now. And yeah, Willie Taggart. Yeah, Willie Taggart. Like yeah, everybody. Yeah, right. All of them in the same pool. Yeah. Did you delete yeah. those tweets or you, you left them on the timeline? Uh, some are Taggart there. tweets. Yeah. Some are there. <laughs> some of the more <laughs> egregious, some of the more egregious yeah. ones have been have been deleted forever. Yeah, once I really like realized the mute button worked, I stopped deleting it. <laughs> no, shoot. I just, <laughs> I get cut off the notifications. Okay, cool. <laughs> That's easy. That's easy. No, I. You know, we we've got a we've got another show next week. We got a, a week for for things to kind of simmer. I I, I thought this was a good therapy session. Uh, I really enjoyed you guys going um, on this adventure together. We've been on for for over two hours now. Uh, we've not done this in a long time. Uh, so, so Bro, this, why don't we? This, uh, this this ruins my like falls, like. I don't what plan on stinking every fall. Like, I don't – like, this ruins my yeah. fall, bro. I enjoy fall. When we suck at football, bro, like <laughs> – like, Yeah. Come on, bro. It ruins you fall. Get, yeah, you get 13 or 14 weeks a year, and you come out disappointed. <laughs> come on, man. Weather, weather, weather was elite today, though. No? Weather was elite. Tell you yeah, what. Just give me Willie Beam and a good weather the rest of this fall, and I'm good. <laughs> there you, know? you go. That's all I got for right now. So here's here's the last one, a little personal yeah. story. Um, Frank, big Frank Del Torre, uh, mm-hmm. shout out to my dad. He, uh, in Little League, uh, I think you're, you can play when you're 10, 11, 12. He inherited a team. Whenever you're drafted, you're on that team until you're out of the league. He inherited a team that had three kids left on it. And my dad picked all 10 and 11-year-olds. And we played all right that first year, played okay, took our lumps. 
when we turned 12, now we have the oldest team in the league. We went undefeated, won the championship. We made shirts that year uh, before Seniority, the season huh? started. Before the, se- before the season started, we made shirts that said, next year starts now. Because the first year on the team, it was, wait, next year we're going to be good. We're just young this year. Next year for Florida starts in two weeks, 1030. You're, th- you're playing for next year. You're not playing for shit this year. There's nothing left to play for. If you throw out Emory Jones as your starting quarterback, then I've seen enough uh, with Dan Mullen. You're, 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 playing, you're, playing for, you're, you're playing for next year. And if Anthony Richardson isn't getting the start and playing 60%, if not more of the snaps, if, if you don't flip-flop the way you've been playing those two, then, then you're then what are, what are you doing here? What are you playing for right now? You you want to go to the, the man? You still Bowl playing semantics. Of- and you still playing little league football if you even playing both right now. Right now, one just look better than the other. One. Play the guy, make him the starter. There's no reason to play two quarterbacks right now. You One's play looking better than another. That's that's your that's guy. What it is, bro? It's not yeah, little league yeah, football. True. Everybody can't be happy. Somebody's gonna have to transfer. This is just big boy ball, man. This is what football is now, man. Grow grow mm-hmm. a sack. Anthony's been loyal. Uh, sorry, Emory's been loyal, and, and you've you've rewarded that. I get it, but like you said, right now you've got one guy to play. Shout out to the the captain of the Titanic. He was loyal to his ship, but he's not. He's dead. So it, <laughs> if, you're, if, you, if you're if you're Dan Mullen, do you want to go down on the Emory ship, or are you going to be like, hey man, that lifeboat looks nice. That that fifteen, that number fifteen lifeboat. I think I'm going to get on it. It's about the whole team, you know. Yeah, there's. A, I think there's a lot more than just quarterback. Yeah, I appreciate that. So let's end the show with a nice little dance. <laughs> <Yeah. answer. laughs> uh, you already know what time it is. You Harry Larrys. <laughs> long, Harry more Larry. four point oh. Harry Larrys. Uh, make sure you cop that long more four point oh. Uh, no snags on them bags, man. Long for. Lawnmower 4.0 has a no snag, no cut, a razor sharp, get, them, get those balls smooth, uh, waterproof, um, and also glow in the dark. Do a lot of things, man. No nicks on your sack, or we send it back. Um, just That's good. 20, it's great insurance, right? <laughs> That's, That's good stuff. Money, right there. I've cut back on my ball. There. I've cut back on my ball uh, deodorant. Um, it's getting cool out. Yeah, yeah well, there's elite, it. remember? Right. Um, there is, I, I do want to shout it out. I, I didn't, I didn't tell you guys that there's a, a package, uh, for your package coming. Uh, Manscaped has announced nice. a new two in one, uh, body wash. So that'll be coming. Oh, that'll be available snap. very, very soon. And there's another thing coming in the next couple of weeks yeah. that we're not allowed to talk about yet, but there's a lot of new stuff coming from Manscaped. Uh, so check it out. Promo code SG. Just That's the best to wash this. man grooming. Just in time to wash the stench of the cocktail party right off of you, Silk. They say, man, this is a fact. I read this on um, some important website, but they said, uh, like, manscaping increased the look of the size of the man region. Okay. Still All right. Well, Images I know, what, I, I know what I'm doing after the show. They really are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Images <laughs> clear a lot. It's like rearview mirrors. <laughs> okay. Uh, we've gone off the rails. We All right. Room, um, man. Who's who's got the song of the way? I think it's me. It was mm-hmm. me last week. Yeah, <laughs> my oh, get, I, went, I went with Lil Wayne. Shout out to Louisiana, and it backfired. It, it damn sure did. All right, well, <laughs> what you got for us, Dan? Um, I'm going to go back to my country music bag. My boy Tyler Childers, who uh, is one mm-hmm. of the best names in country music, has a new song out for the first time in a while, um, and it's called "Yes, I Guess They Ought to Name a Drink After You." So brand that's a, new. That's the whole name? That's a long name, right? I think he could have gone a little shorter, but. Dang, that's a long yeah. name. That's a How'd long How did that go across the car? Title. That whole title go across the car when you look Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the time that the title goes over, the song's over. Right. Yes, story. I guess they ought to name a drink after you. But it's Tyler Childers, so you know it slaps. Um, same corner, same time next week, boys. Absolutely. Same corner, By same week time. blues, man. By week blues. By week blues. Oh.